welcome to the Assemble Conference. It is my great pleasure to introduce you Professor Melody Clark. She's an individual merit promotion scientist at the British Antarctic Survey, and also a project leader. Uh, she has a uh, genetics degree and a PhD from London University and joined the British Antarctic Survey in 2003, uh, where she currently leads the adaptations group. In 2007, she was awarded the Senior Prize for Outstanding Women in Marine Biological Sciences uh, by the Network of Excellence Marine Genomics Europe, and she is also awarded the Polar Medal for Antarctic and Antarctic in 2022 for a scientific contribution to polar sciences. She's also an honorary professor in the School of Biological and Marine Sciences uh, at the University of Plymouth. And uh, so Mel, thank you very much for accepting this, uh, uh, to be here and give you your, your talk. Uh, the, the talk will be about polar marine responses to a changing world. So please go ahead. Thank you very much, Adelina. I'll just share my screen and hopefully this will work. Whoops. Is that okay? That's cool. fine. Fantastic. So thank you very much, firstly, for inviting me to give a talk. Uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here today. And what I want to do is talk a bit about um, polar marine responses to climate change. But what I thought I'd do, because this is an assemble meeting and about uh, assemble is about genomic observatories, I'd talk a bit about the long-term monitoring that we do at our Antarctic Research Station and then go into uh, talking about <coughs> how we use transcriptomics to protect, to um, predict responses to change, uh, some of the constraints that we have working with polar species, and then go into a couple of examples where we're trying to develop more realistic experiments. It's not going forward. Oops. Hang on. Sorry. Adelina, it's not forwarding. I don't um, know. Strange. Straight up. Okay. Yeah, there you oh, go. Fine. Maybe I just need to hit the keys fine. So, this is rather a research station in the Antarctic. Um, it was a part of a, a EMBRC. Uh, we left recently for non Brexit related reasons, I, I hasten to add. So, um, particularly nice to be able to still talk to people about this. This is, the marine, this is the marine lab where I do most of my Antarctic research at Rothera. And rather fortuitously, I guess, for uh, the UK and, and for researchers in general, if you're interested in accessing Rothera, is that it's halfway along the Antarctic Peninsula. Whoops, let's just get my pointer working. Halfway along the Antarctic Peninsula on Adelaide Island, which is an area of rapid climate change, regional climate change. Air temperatures have gone up about three degrees in 50 years and temperatures have increased by about a degree. So in terms of a genomic observatory, it's in a fantastic place to monitor climate change in action. I'm gonna talk a bit about some of the long-term monitoring that we do at Rothera, which has been, which was initiated in 1997, which is when the Marine Station was inaugurated. This is the Rother Rothera Oceanographic and Biological Time Series. For some reason, it's abbreviated as, as RATS, but, and we do a whole series of year round measurements. And Rothera, I think, is currently the only Antarctic Marine Station that has a year round dive team that enable us to do this. The mainstay of the RATS program are our weekly CTD deployments at the CTD goes down to about 400 meters. And we deploy twice a week in the summer and whenever we can in the winter, depending on conditions. We have a number of sites. This is our preferred site where we can go down to, to 400 meters, but obviously we can't necessarily make that all the time. We have strong links with the Palmer LTER program and the research, US research ship, the Gould calls in every year to calibrate our CTD. So there are kind of strong US uh, UK links. We measure a whole bunch of things with the CTD. Uh, these are just some examples, temperature, salinity. We also look at ice cover. And you can see the data here from about 1998, where you look at temperature with depth and you can see the nice, you can see a really nice uh, depiction of the warmer um, 
mixed lead depth um, compared to the rest of it and how it varies from year to year and between the years. Well, yes, from year to year. Sorry, it's too early in the morning. As part of this, we also do Ocean Sampling Day. <clears throat> we were one of the first groups to sign up to this when it was part of Micro V3. We've continued this through with Assemble Plus and whatever happens, we will still continue to do this and participate with everybody in Assemble Plus. And the good news is that yesterday they got the uh, Ocean Sampling Day sample for this summer. We also do monthly collections of eight marine invertebrates all year round. Uh, you can see here the guys go down through the ice in the winter. These are Olympic, a sea star, a rather revolting giant nematine worm, a brittle star, terabellids, a sea cucumber. Uh, these have been all collected since 1997. Uh, and then about five years ago, we added the sea urchin and uh, Equiolda aitsi, which is a, a bivalve mollusk. And the idea behind this is to look at their reproductive output each month and correlate that across the years, but also with environmental factors to see what drives reproductive output and how uh, that is affected by, by climate change. Most of the data are currently with um, collaborators at, at universities and are still being worked, worked up. Um, the interesting sideline to this is we've discovered that you can also use it to look at microplastics over the years, which is kind of quite interesting. We also look at iceberg scare and disturbance using standard settlement panels that's seen here, which are left in place and photographed by divers. And to monitor iceberg scare, we have this system where we put in concrete blocks, small concrete blocks in a grid pattern on the seabed at different depths in specific sites. Um, obviously, if an iceberg comes along, it smashes the block to bits and we'll be able to identify uh, whether an icebergs come along. And we monitor these and we uh, fairly regularly and uh, to document iceberg scare. I guess kind of related to this is our participation in the ARMS project. Again, this is Assemble Plus and again, something we will continue. This is a nice picture of an arms uh, that Matthias Ob sent me. This is the picture of the arms that we deployed near the Cheshire Logger at, at Rothera. And um, this is what we got back, which is slightly dented after three years. Uh, it, it was in for a long time because of COVID. Um, and I have to say that we probably didn't follow the assemble protocol for um, disassembling the unit. Uh, basically, we had to take an angle grinder to it to, to get the plates apart. But we do have some really nice looking plates and some really nice data. These have been redeployed and we're gonna continue this project. So these are kind of long-term data sets and they're great, they're fantastic. They're really essential for understanding long-term responses to climate change at kind of realistic timescales. But you do need decades of data really to build up an accurate picture of what's going on to disassociate the long-term change from the annual kind of noise and variation that you get. So what I want to do now is, is really talk more about using transcriptomics and using other methods to predict responses to change rather than waiting for decades to um, analyze the data from your surveys. I'm going to talk about particularly about transcriptomics because that, that's my field of study. And most of that work is based on the work, physiological work of Lloyd Peck, who works at the British Antarctic Survey, who carried out some fantastic work demonstrating the vulnerability of Antarctic species using upper lethal temperatures. So what Lloyd did was, he, um, and these are the results of the data here, he looked at the upper lethal temperature limits of Antarctic marine species using a variety of thermal ramping rates. So here we see the data, each dot is an individual species um, within that dot there are at least 20 to 30 individuals and these animals are warmed up until they become comatose at one degree an hour, uh, one degree a day, one degree every three days, one degree a month, however, and longer time scales. I mean 
obviously these ramping rates are not, you would say we're not relevant to climate change, they're far too rapid and you'd be absolutely right. But the great thing is that um, the observation that as you warm the animal up more slowly, the temperature they go to is, is actually much lower. But when you graph all the data up, you get a nice curve as shown here. And so you can extrapolate the data from three months to a year, to two years, two decades. And using these data, Lloyd's estimation was that the vast majority of Antarctic marine species were, can only survive up to about their current summer maxima. So they're really thermally sensitive. Now at the time, and in the paper, we discussed the reasons why some animals are more resilient and more or others are more sensitive. So for example, you can see there's a huge range in the um, upper lethal limits of different species. And we discussed whether the limits to survival were different at different rates and whether there was a universal mechanism. And what we decided to do was to investigate this in more detail using transcriptomics. So the first experiment we carried out was using rac rapid ramping rates. Uh, one degree an hour. <clears throat> and given the physiological experiments, we had a whole bunch of species where we knew their thermal limits at one degree an hour. And so we chose six of them. The bivalve Aquiodiorate, which is, is basically bulletproof, uh, really doesn't mean, mind being warmed up at all. Uh, the clam Latinula elliptica, which uh, is pretty resilient. And then three intermediate species, uh, the crustacean Parasaurodocus, sea cucumber, uh, cucumeria, and the brachiopod Lytharella uva. And finally, coming in at the bottom, which is highly uh, sensitive to warming, is the rather charismatic sea lemon. And what we did was warm these animals up one degree an hour, and then sample them before they were actually uh, co before they reached much before they reached their upper lethal limit. Our hypothesis for why animals were more resilient at, at these rapid ramping rates was that we thought the animals that were more resilient were more tolerant, tolerant of anaerobic end products. And therefore this project started off as a metabolomics experiment in collaboration with the University of Birmingham. And um, on, because we could actually identify succinate, which is the anaerobic end product in these animals, However, the data were slightly disappointing, uh, to put it mildly. Um, these are the results of the mass spec analyses and the presence or absence of, of metabolites. The first thing to notice is that we only have three species down here. And, and in actual fact, we only got separation of metabolites for three species, which was really disappointing considering that you're warming them up one degree in an hour and uh, that's pretty, stressful and they, there's no response. We didn't get much of a response from Lyotharella and furthermore, when we looked at the anaerobic end products, which are succinate, they don't correlate with thermal resilience. So we actually got uh, less succinate in, in Aquiodia, which is actually more resilient than Latinula. So overall, we didn't get what we expected and it was clearly very disappointing in terms of writing it up. So what we, fortunately, what we had was we had all the samples still in the minus 80 freezer, the exact same individuals, the exact same tissues. So we did a transcriptomic analysis, partly because we were really curious as to why we didn't actually get a response with the three other species. And, and really what was undergoing, what was underpinning the response, because we re really didn't seem to be getting much of a response at all, certainly on the metabolite front. And these are the, the data. Uh, these are shown in terms of the biochemical pathway that we identified in the transcriptomics experiments, and then their presence or absence uh, across the species going from uh, low thermal tolerance in the sea lemon through to Aquiodia 8C uh, being the most tolerant. And the first Thing really to know is for fans of heat shock proteins, of which I am one, and there are classic candidate genes for responses to stress, it's only present in three species. So in terms of using heat shock proteins as a candidate for responses to stress, it clearly 
isn't going to work at this temperature. Uh, respiration was only expressed in, in two species. And you can see that we get a whole range of different biochemical pathways expressed, but the number of pathways expressed and the variety does not correlate with resilience to warming. All we could really say is that, and it was kind of interesting, that the more resilient species express more biochemical pathways than the ones that basically weren't giving us much of a result at all, either transcriptomically or metabolomically. And therefore, there's a very individual response between the different species to the same ramping rate. And at this point, I should emphasize that all these animals came from the same bay in Rothera in the same week, and so had experienced the same environmental conditions uh, as, as far as possible. So we made things as, as equal as we could between the different species. When we looked overall at the data, there was basically no correlation to the heat shock response with resilience, the presence of anaerobic end products, or the number of biochemical pathways. What was quite noticeable, again, is, is this more kind of active response, really, in many ways, that the three most resilient species were expressing more transcripts compared to the more uh, sensitive species. And in actual fact, getting about 30 upregulated transcripts in these three species was quite unusual in the fact that this was next generation sequencing. We were doing Illumina sequencing. We got thousands of transcripts and basically not a lot was happening with these guys. <clears throat> and it seems that potentially the more resilient species have a more active response. And I will refer to this, this phenomenon again later in the talk. But clearly this is only one ramping rate. And so what we wanted to do then is to expand this to different ramping rates, which we managed to do and, and then published fairly recently with the help of Michael Collins from the University of Plymouth, who did all the bioinformatics analysis for us. So for this study, what we did, we took three, we actually just took three species, uh, Paraceridocus again, the crustacean, the sea urchin, Stericinus, and the limpet. They sell her. And this time we subjected them all to different ramping rates of one degree an hour, one degree a day, one degree every three days, and also a three month acclimation at plus two degrees. And my, um, what we want to do was see if there are any similarities in response between the different species at the same ramping rate or within the same species at different ramping rates. And my hypothesis was that everything would be completely different and I have to say probably for the only time in my career when I made a hypothesis about the results of a transcriptomic experiment I was actually right. Um, it's never happened again because normally you do a transcriptomic experiment, you make a hypothesis and then you have to revise what that was when you finally see what comes out at the other end. And this is exemplified by the this, uh, these data on expression of classical stress response genes. So, so what Mike did was he pulled out all the catalases, the glutathione families and the heat shock proteins and also superoxide dismutase from the data set. And you can see here with this heat map that we have identified a number of heat shock proteins in all the, which are shown in black in all three species. And then looked at the presence or absence of these uh, in the different ramping rates and also in the acclimation. And you can see that there's a huge variability in response. Okay, so you do get heat shock proteins produced in, in nacella and, and stericinus in the, in the limpet and the urchin in response to one degree an hour, but nothing in the crustacean. And natural fact, not a lot seems to happen in the crustacean at all uh, until you get to everything being down-regulated in, in the acclimation. So again, there's no pattern. There are no real um, universal responses, particularly in terms of what are termed classical stress response genes that are often used in candidate gene approaches. And these data are further validated when we look at the, the upregulated transcripts and coordinate these across the four different treatments. And you can see here that we are getting a significant number, quite a high number of 
genes are regulated or transcripts are regulated in response to the four treatments. But when you correlate them between all four treatments, you only get two in common. Um, and this is the result from uh, the limpet, Nacella. And when we do the same for the two other species, there are actually no genes in common. So everything is completely different, which really emphasizes the fact that if you want to monitor or look for stress responses in the environment, you really do need to take a kind of wider approach, uh, look at a range of different species, but also tailor it to that particular environment because uh, the response is highly individualistic. So what may work in one area may not work in, in terms of candidate genes, may not work in, in another, simply because the environmental conditions are different and they impact the animal differently. So having described this kind of highly individualistic response, um, the, all those data were generated on adults of similar sizes, really, to try and reduce the variation that we get in wild species. So I just want to talk a bit now about some of the constraints that we have on this. So the um, responses of different life history traits and really the importance of timing in experiments or in the case of the Antarctic, it's patience, really, to be honest. Um, so we all know that very young animals, embryos and larvae are the most sensitive of uh, life stages. And I just want to talk a bit about uh, the work of Colleen Suckling, who is a PhD student in, in our project. And her PhD was, part of her PhD was to examine the response of the sea urchin Stericinus non mayeri to the combined stresses of warming and low pH. Her project involved keeping these guys in culture under altered conditions for two years. And this is really important. This length of time was vital because although these animals spawn every year, they have two cohorts of eggs in their gonads and one, is really, one of those cohorts is released each year. So effectively, it takes two years for the eggs to develop under the old, under completely from start to finish. And therefore, if you want to culture the eggs under altered conditions for the entire length of the development, you're gonna to have to do the experiment for two years. And we know this is really important and has been demonstrated in numerous other species because of the effect of maternal conditioning. And the effect of the mother can really affect the quality of the egg and the prognosis for the larvae. Largely because the, with the egg before it's fertilized contains some transcripts, these are purely maternal transcripts, which are then, as the egg is, is fertilized, is, are then replaced by the zygotic transcripts. So the condition of the mother is really important in terms of the future prognosis for uh, survival of the larvae. So Colleen did a couple of things. Firstly, she looked at the acclimation of adults to the altered conditions using uh, oxygen uh, consumption as a metric for whole animal acclimation. And these data are shown here. So this is oxygen consumption outside, and along we have uh, the various sampling times, including going up to 24 months at the end. The columns uh, are the, the first one, the, the black one is actually adults under uh, control conditions. So no degree C and uh, no, uh, no difference standard pH. And then we have the next two columns are animals that are warmed to plus two degrees and under altered conditions. So they, the first one are, is kind of moderate reduction in pH by 0.3 units. And the second one is a more severe condi uh, condition of minus 0.5 units. And you can see that when the animals are first placed in the altered conditions, there's a massive increase in their oxygen consumption as they kind of struggle to uh, cope with the altered conditions. But the differences gradually decrease over time such that after eight months, there is no significant difference at all between the oxygen consumption rates of any of the animals, controls or treated. 
So, <clears throat> um, so it basically takes eight months for the adults to acclimate. Um, so you can see that it's really important. These, you can start to see that these timescales are really important. And then what Colleen also did was she spawned the animals at six months and also at 17 months to identify how the acclimation of the adults and how the development of the eggs in the altered conditions affect larval outcomes. And these are shown quite nicely here with uh, showing data showing egg sizes at spawning. So here we have the data at six months uh, of egg size. Uh, the black again are the animals under the control conditions. Then we have animals that are just warmed up at plus two with no alteration in pH. And then we have the two uh, warmed and low pH conditions, minus 0.3 units, minus 0.5. I think it's fairly obvious that <laughs> at six months, the animals in the control conditions have much larger eggs than the animals under the altered conditions. And clearly, it would appear that uh, altering the environmental conditions has a negative effect on egg size. However, at 17 months, you get a very different response. And it's actually the animals in the control conditions that actually have the smaller eggs and the size of the eggs produced by the animals under the altered conditions either just warming or warming and, and alter pH are much larger. And this is a known phenomenon um, in that it's known that marine invertebrates, when they're in stressful conditions, do actually produce fewer but larger eggs to try and maximize the chances of for their offspring of survival under the kind of more rigorous conditions, as it, as it were. So basically by having a larger egg you can stick in more nutrients you can stick in uh, more kind of beneficial transcripts whatever but it, it does help larval survival and these data are mirrored in the spawning experiments and the survival of the larvae over a period of uh, this was actually 17 days as shown along the bottom and this is uh, larval survival at the side and what we find at, at six months is kind of what most people would expect. Basically, you get the best result with your low temperature control, followed by just animals being warmed, and then you don't get a particularly high survival rate with the animals in warming and low pH, only about 30%. So just taking these data, you would say, okay, fine. <laughs> It's not really, the prognosis is not great for sea urchins at all in the Antarctic. Um, however, if you hang on in there and carry on the experiment for 18 months, you get a very different picture. And we got uh, a big increase in survival for the high temperature control. So we got an increase in 10% of normal survival, but the major difference was this big increase in survival of animals under the altered conditions from 30% to 50 to 75%. Um, and if you're wondering where the control is, it's down there and we think something went horribly wrong as things can do when you actually carry things, do these long-term experiments. But basically by culturing the animals for 18 months, by culturing the eggs under the altered conditions for 18 months, the chances of survival were much better. And when you think about it, you get an increase from 30 to 50 to 75%, which is pretty amazing. But if you think about the fact that we change the conditions for these animals very rapidly compared to climate change, then the prognosis is 18 months is that these uh, urchins will probably survive quite well in the future. It probably won't affect them at all because clearly they have this very plastic response and they can respond to the altered conditions. And so, as I say, six months you think they're all doomed, 18 months they seem fine. A particular issue with polar species is age because a lot of the species are long lived. And so at the opposite end of the spectrum, there is also an age effect and older animals I guess, as you could say, older human beings are more vulnerable than the younger ones. And we know from various physiological experiments that have been carried out largely by um, Doris Arbely at, at the RV, who unfortunately is no longer with us, um, Eva Phillip and Lloyd Peck, that 
using physiological metrics, we know that thermal resilience decreases with age, the immune capacity, the older animals bury less rapidly because these are informal creatures. And the older ones are more affected by sedimentation and injury. And when we started to look at the transcriptomic response, um, again, we got differences and we found a real difference between young and old animals. And, and the younger ones have this much more robust response that I showed you earlier. So these guys, if you subjected them to a change, were actively producing antioxidants, heat shock proteins. They were producing uh, more energy pathways, whereas the older ones were just kind of sitting in their back chair, not really doing an awful lot at, at all, uh, I guess, hoping that things would, would change dramatically on their own. And these data are probably exemplified, but some data on the response to damage repair with age, uh, which is data from the PhD of Vicky Slight, who was at the lab, um, who's a PhD student in the lab, and who is now at the University of Aberdeen as a lecturer. And her PhD project was to look at biomineralization in the Antarctic clam and using transcriptomics. And she did this by drilling a small hole in the shell and then waiting till the hole healed, but taking samples of mantle under the, the wound to look at what genes were expressed in response to repair and therefore potentially with biomineralization. A rough cut of the data sh shown here, which is, uh, this shows the time course of the experiment uh, in, in days, so up to about four months, with the number of differentially expressed transcripts. And I should point out that this is a, a log, uh, um, the axis is in, in the log scale. And she did three different age cohorts. So she did uh, very small animals, which were less than a year old, and, and basically they had no response. And we think this is because they have very thin shells, they're producing shell rapidly because they're growing, and a small hole isn't going to make much difference, and they repair it really quickly. The adolescents, which are about three years old, increase their gene expression up to about a couple of months, which is when they generally repair their shell and then expression rates return back to normal, effectively. But with the adults, the gene expression levels just keep on going up and up and up. And unfortunately, we didn't have enough animals to continue this beyond uh, the experiment beyond four months, but these animals can take at least six months to repair their shell. But there's a huge question as to why adults take so long to do anything. I mean, they have the same genes as the younger animals, in theory, they can respond in the same way, but why does it take them so long? And I, I have this theory, which I have yet to prove, uh, that it's because basically they spend their whole time sitting in the mud, doing nothing for years on end. And all they're doing in the mud is they're respiring, they're eating, they're reproducing, but they're not doing a lot else. And given the fact these animals can live till they're 37, you can be sitting at for 37 years in the same place. So I think what they're probably doing is just shutting things off, potentially using epigenetic techniques. And we started to investigate this, and, and this is really, I think, a fantastic time to be involved in marine genomics and involved in marine research, because with the explosion and uh, in sequencing technologies and the decrease in price, we're starting to be able to produce genomes for these animals and start to apply techniques from model species onto our kind of non-model species, as it were. And Vicky and I are really lucky to have a collaboration with Kevin Cocott from the University of Alabama, who is currently sequencing the genome of the clan, Latineuroleptica and also Equiodia aetsi. Um, that's proved slightly problematic as only genomes of mollusks can be. And also there is a kind of COVID interval. So things are taking longer than we would hope. But we also have a project with the University of Edinburgh carrying out bisulfite sequencing on different age cohorts of the, the Antarctic clam. And what we wanted to see was whether there are methylation differences between young and older animals and whether older animals were more methylated than the younger animals. Uh, we have the first draft of the report. As always, it's complicated. It's not simple. I was hoping that we'd have 
not much methylation in young animals and shed loads, lots and lots. In older animals, that hasn't happened. It's far more subtle. And so we need to start to uh, look at that data in more detail, or maybe even start to look at uh, different types of epigenetic mechanisms. As I say, it's a really exciting time to be involved in marine genomics. We can start to do bisulfite sequencing on these guys. We can really start to look at the effects of epigenetics because we do know that it dramatically, it can dramatically impact animal performance. And what I'd like to do is finish off really. So, okay, so those experiments were transcriptomic. They were largely in the lab uh, in Aquaria which is a very artificial environment, which is often a kind of criticism of them. But what I want to do now is, is talk to you about a couple of experiments where we've tried to make the conditions more realistic and use transcriptomics to understand what is going on. The first one is long-term acclimation using heated settlement panels. So I think most marine uh, biologists know about settlement panels. These are slightly special, they're slightly larger. <coughs> they have an electrical heater in them uh, attached to an electric, uh, electric cable which goes up to the surface to a junction box. So this is a heated settlement panel and we are able to heat the boundary layer of this panel to plus one and plus two degrees above ambient temperature. And these were designed by Lloyd Peck and the Antarctic Marine Engineering Division at, at Bass. These are very robust uh, devices and they can be placed in the sea, as we can see here, and they can be left there for months and months and months. They're clipped onto um, standard concrete blocks. These are concrete blocks that you buy to put in your garden. In fact, we probably bought them from a garden centre, to be honest. But you can put these on the blocks, you can put control panels next to plus one and plus two heated, uh, heated panels, and you can leave them there for months. And the great thing is that the, these panels are encrusted by biofouling species identical to the ones that you find in the rocks around them, but they're in totally natural conditions. So temperatures the same, salinity, food supply, light, everything. It's entirely natural conditions. And we monitor these by, uh, the di every so often the divers come along, they photograph this area using high resolution uh, photography. And so we can track when species, individual species colonize, when individual animals colonize, how rapidly they grow, and the community interactions uh, between the different species colonizing them with time. And we got some fantastic uh, results. And these are the data at nine months. Uh, this is the work of Gail Ashton, who was the PhD project, uh, the postdoc, sorry, on the project. And the results are summarized in this schematic here. So uh, this is the control panel where the um, brown splodges are bryozoans, followed, and the kind of little white things are spiral bit worms. With just one degree in warming, you get this massive overgrowth of bryozoans because these are the primary colonizers. They decrease the space for colonization, so you get a decrease in biodiversity with just one degree in warming. But also, I think you can see that the spiral bid worms are larger. And Gail measured the growth rates of six different species and found that all of them doubled their growth rates with just one degree of warming, which is absolutely phenomenal. And that's all think, think, thinking back to the original physiological experiment that I showed you with the upper lethal limits, you would say, okay, fine, well, you were completely wrong, because clearly these animals are doing fine. Um, but there is a caveat to these results. And that is that these animals are filter feeders. And we finished, we analyzed this experiment, or rather Gail did, at the end of summer. And the reason we did this was one of the issues of working in the Antarctic is a very large iceberg came along and smashed our main site to bits. So all the concrete blocks were completely destroyed. The panels were still functioning, but given the fact we only had a week left before we left, we had two other sites, we were really worried that we would end up with no data uh, when we came back next summer. So Gail decided to analyze the data 
uh, after nine months, we managed to put the panels into the uh, flow through aquarium to keep them going for uh, another year. So that the following season, Laura Villotta Nieva, who's a PhD project, who's a PhD student in our lab, could go along and do some molecular analyses. And her project was to look at the transcriptomic response of spiral bigworms to warming. So luckily, Lara had access to the two other sites and also to these panels that were had been kept over winter. And I'm sure you're aware, anyone who works on spiral bigworms, they're highly calcified. Uh, it's kind of difficult to know what kind of state they're in, to be honest. And the first thing she did, that Lara did, was a very simple experiment. It was, it was just to look at their upper lethal limits. Um, with as a measure of whole animal acclimation and with the assumption that if an animal has acclimated to a warmer temperature their upper lethal limits will have gone up and the initial prognosis is not good I'm afraid so these are the control animals their upper lethal temperature goes down at plus one and it goes further down at plus two so clearly the animals have not acclimated even though they're still there the following summer and these data you get more detail when you start to look at the expression of these animals. And I know this is kind of a bit of a mess, but basically in terms of differential expression on the plus one animals, you get about 14,000 genes upregulated, which is impossible to analyze on a kind of gene by gene basis. So we looked at functional enrichment between the plus one animals and the zero degree animals, and there was none whatsoever. So clearly what these animals were doing was struggling with the warmer temperatures and basically just throwing the kitchen sink at everything to try and, and keep them going at the warmer temperatures. And clearly they'd have a higher metabolic rate anyway because they're warmer. So basically just huge amounts of gene expression. A very different pattern at plus two where only about a thousand genes were upregulated and the data are shown here and these um, Plat, um, schematic. And in this case, Go enrichment showed that transcription and translation processes were upregulated in the plus two degree animals. Uh, we also found genes involved in energy production, uh, cytoskeleton, which is a metric for, can be a, a marker for uh, responses to warming, uh, stress response, and also cell cycle. But what was fairly obvious was that these animals had undergone over a tipping point. So they couldn't cope with the warm conditions. So what they were doing was they're gradually closing off all their genes that they possibly could and keeping the bare minimum uh, in going in case things could return to normal and, and they could cope better. So they're keeping transcription and translation going, but turning everything else off. And to put it politely, these animals were in a state of kind of terminal senescence, um, I believe the term is. And so, again, timing is important in that, at, conversely, when you look at the urchin experiment, things looked bad at six months, they looked great at uh, 18 months. With, in terms of this warming experiment, things look great at nine months, but actually long term, these animals really are struggling to maintain um, homeostasis at warmer temperatures and clearly will not survive long term into the future. So going back again to the upper lethal limit data, clearly these animals are actually far more sensitive than we thought they were in, in the first place. So those data do hold. And finally, I'd like to finish on a natural experimental system uh, in the Arctic. So we do occasionally venture up well, I don't, uh, to the Arctic. And this is the work of Jakob Turing, who spent two years as postdoc at, at Bass and now has a permanent position at the University of Aarhus in Denmark. And Jakob has spent his entire life, his scientific life, uh, studying the intertidal in Greenland. He's been there uh, many expeditions and he's studying life in the intertidal and with his favorite animal, the blue mussel Mytilus edulis. Uh, deploying data loggers and distributions and biodiversity in the intertidal. And in the past, it's always been thought that the very cold temperatures and the ice in Greenland in the winter are the real problem for species colonizing Greenland, particularly colonization from Northern Europe. But clearly, uh, 
the Arctic is being subjected to rapid regional climate change and things are warming up, so the winter temperatures aren't so much of a problem. But Jakob discovered that this, it's at the other end of the temperature range where problems may occur. And he's logged temperatures of 32 degrees in the intertidal in Greenland, which is pretty amazing and pretty warm and well above the upper lethal temperature of Vitalis edulis. And he's got this great experimental system. Well, it's not really an experimental system, it's a natural system. So he can take, uh, so this is uh, one of his sites in the outer fjord near Nuke, which is the capital of Greenland. And when you look at the temperatures in the intertidal region uh, in the outer fjord, which is subject to these you know, big currents here, you get temperatures around about 20 degrees maximum in the summer. And, and these are data for three months over the summer. And that's entirely survivable by uh, Mytilus edulis, well within its temperature range. And subtidal temperatures around about six degrees, six to eight degrees. However, when you go to the inner fjord, you still get Mytilus edulis, but you get a very different temperature ranges. So uh, the subtidal, you're getting about 10 to 12 degrees. Again, very survivable by Mytilus, but it's here that you're getting 32 degrees of temperature in the intertidal, which clearly is a real problem potentially for Mytilus edulis. And so Jakob asked if we could do some transcriptomic analysis because we thought basically these guys would probably be really suffering in the heat. And the great thing is that because um, Illumina sequencing is so common, it's much cheaper. We were able just to send these uh, samples off to Novagene and we actually got them to do the analysis as, as well. And we just did the biological annotation, which I would highly recommend because it meant that neither Jakob nor myself had to learn how to do transcriptomics and uh, learn how to make transcriptomes. And these are the results, which are highly surprising. Uh, you don't need to understand what it means, it's just look at the patterns and, and they're all very similar. Effectively, each line is an individual transcript and the color represents whether they're upregulated in red or downregulated in blue. But these are the samples we send off to Novagene. There is no significant difference between any of them. And this is fairly remarkable when you think that anything labeled MI was sampled at 28 degrees in the intertidal. Anything labelled MC, the animals were taken from the subtitle at four degrees, and anything labelled MO were sampled at 20 degrees. So you, the amazing thing is you've got the same species, the same population, you've got a 24 degree temperature difference, and there is no difference in, in transcription, or no significant difference in the transcription profiles of these animals, which was surprising. But then when we thought about it and read a bit about, about things, um, there are two possible reasons. One is that these animals are only in the low end tidal, so they're only exposed for about four hours. Obviously, when they're first exposed, they'll be wet. They can lose uh, heat by evaporation. But also animals that are subject to this really kind of fluctuate, heavy fluctuating temperature, really routine fluctuating temperature regime, are much more tolerant to changes in temperature and have higher thermal tolerances than animals that are used to living in a very stable environment. And so we think that's why we got this slightly unexpected result, which basically means that uh, mussel farming in Greenland is probably safe for the near future. Interesting as a sideline, Jakob also took some animals from the subtidal and, and warmed them up to 22 and 32 to simulate the intertidal in the lab and got completely different results, uh, which really emphasizes the utility of trying to identify natural sites where you get natural temperature variations to really look at the response in the natural environment. So I think these two examples show really nicely that uh, transcriptomics can help understand responses to change. Uh, it can take a long time to do your experiments. But by using natural systems and trying to make um, experiments more realistic, I think we're getting a better understanding of how animals respond to change. And going forward, I think with the, the huge um, increase in sequencing technologies and, and the decrease in costs, we can really start to exploit 
techniques in, in, that are used in model species routinely and start to exploit them in uh, non-model species. And I will finish there with pictures of um, the ice cliff outside Rothera, which is looking out of the office, which has gone back dramatically over the past um, few years since I've been going to Rothera. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Mel. Um, are there any questions? I've got one. In fact, it's it's interesting because we've just before you were uh, going to where, where you show this uh, uh, muscle uh, in Iceland the story. I, I was just thinking about um, precisely the changing temperatures, the variation in temperature. Because so you know in, in the experiments in the Antarctica, uh, and in fact, I think this this last. Uh, experiment that you showed where artificially you change the temperature what is done is a continuous change so you you ramp up at different rates but essentially it's a constant change mm. and i'm just wondering you know in the future and of antarctica okay the temperature is going up but probably it will become more variable and yeah. so Perhaps one kind of experimental setup could be, okay, on average, to increase a certain amount, but do it in a fluctuating way and see if the response is, is the same. Of course, the problem here, we are compressing too much normally, but, uh, but basically, instead of, of having a continuous change, is, you know, to go up and down, up and down, but on average, you know, you increase by one degree or by two degrees or something like that, in some ways to mimic what the muscles were were having probably in, in uh, Iceland, because I suspect that during the day and night, the temperature may change quite dramatically. I don't know, I'm just uh, guessing. <laughs> no, I agree. And uh, there's a paper published recently by one of Lloyd's PhD students, Rebecca Delish, where she did actually do fluctuating, she did heat wave treatments on Antarctic uh, animals um, on on the urchin, and I think I, I I don't remember the exact details, but it was for that specific reason. And mm -hmm. I think they actually did okay, but you you would have to. Um, I mean, I I can send you the reference. Uh, I haven't read mm -hmm. it in detail, but I agree with you. Um, I would also say that. I think in many ways we've shot ourselves in the foot in, <laughs> by doing these long-term experiments and showing that that time does make a huge difference in that yeah. we would have to set up a very long experiment uh, and even just doing maintaining one constant condition for for two years is a huge feat um, mm -hmm. but we are definitely thinking now of doing more along the lines of doing these kind of small heat wave ex experiments and we'll do more of those in the future because I, I think you're absolutely right um the temperature may gradually go up but it is going to be fluctuating definitely yeah and more variable probably no. is there any any other questions that you anyone would like to ask well if not thank you very much mel that no. was a uh, very interesting it's uh you know plenty of plenty of sequences there <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and if anybody's got any questions, they can always think of anything later. They can always contact me by email. It's not a problem. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello, Yvonne. Hello. Is to file uh, funds for contracts and funding for the maintenance. These are the main issues. And this, that, these were hot spots that we were collecting for the second tier study that we did in the survey uh, analysis of the, our business plans. About opportunities, only the small, smallest marine station uh, mentioned opportunities. When it comes to regions, it was amazing. In the SWOT analysis, when you see, when it comes to the connectivity to regions, uh, green was a smashing. And a very important thing, when you see the very small green dots connecting one country to another, for instance, in Algarve to the south of Spain or the north of Portugal to Galicia, or ourselves in the University of the Basque Country with the Aquitaine or in the region of the Balkans, 
there was a lot of transregional cooperation. So greenness masses when we call on regional implication. The strengths are that there is a strong territorial embedding and the creation in some places of regional innovation ecosystems. It's important that in many of the marine biological stations, as you can see in the figure here below, sorry, if you look here below, you will see the map that we produce in one of our projects in collaboration with CPMR. And most of the peripheral maritime regions spot marine bioresources very high into the uh, uh, smart specialization, specialization strategies in one way or in another. And in the cohesion policy, marine bioresources are prioritized in the blue growth agenda. And this will be very much or will be very clear when we listen to Eleni Hachigiani in the last talk today. Transregional seas also foster regional collaboration, and that's clear, for instance, in the Baltic Sea or in the Mediterranean Sea. There are opportunities in, in transregional collaboration, and it's true that being regional, we are strategically placed to translate science into societal impact in our regions. Which are the weaknesses and threats? Okay, some, uh, some uh, marine stations declare that they have low influence in the regional agenda. In many cases, it's due to the circumstances in which their countries are arranged. And there is competition nationally, because if I am in a region, there is another region competing for the same funds. There is uh, some cases in which the regional agenda is not aligned with the European agenda, and it's against what would some of the marine stations uh, saw as strengths. And uh, in some marine stations, we are clear that regionally, we are also fighting with another, other stakeholders. For instance, we have a very powerful oceanographic institute besides us. When it comes to technology transfer and innovation, it's clear that marine biological stations, when the SWOT analysis was done, they do very little applied science. There is very little technology transfer, maybe with one exception, which is policy services or services for administration, mainly in monitoring. So in technology transfer and innovation, we declare or some declare solid connections with national stakeholders and business associations. The only thing that is very clear is the policy transfer for ecosystem monitoring, for consultancy and products in aquaculture, and for management of specific ecosystems. And some declare support to small and medium enterprises and the creation of spin-offs, but little contact with the big industry. We also know that we have a strong position nationally in some, uh, some fields, mainly in aquaculture. The opportunities are that we have or we saw a lot of flexibility towards research trends, and we interact with the private sector through our service provision uh, approach. We do access, uh, access provision, and through this, we are able to meet the industrial stakeholders. It's clear that the socioeconomic trends and the plans for the blue bioeconomy at the European level, they offer opportunities uh, for marine biological stations. But the main weakness, the main thing we see, it's we only do TLR1, TLR2, at the most TLR3, and we have a complete lack of technology transfer liaison offices, and what is more important, a complete lack of technology transfer culture. If you are a researcher, you think on your research. You do not think too much in technology transfer. And this is what it happens in marine biological stations. Human resources, very important because you will see afterwards that human resources is the major part of our expenses in marine biological stations. We are in complete love with our researchers. We think they are the most, the best. They are the best one to take them in your voyage to the in your voyage along the ocean. Uh, weaknesses. We see that service provision, it's normally in many in the small stations, very reliant on researchers. 
the researchers themselves have to provide the services and they do not like to do that. We lack permanent researchers in some circumstances. And normally the scientific to service provision staff ratios are awful. In many cases, there are not enough technicians. This leads to the threats. And the main threat is that few people do everything in marine biological stations. And there are limitations to contract technicians. When it comes to infrastructure and services, we are happy with our equipment. We have data services, we have culture collections, and we have a culture of access provision. Even Darwin already called the attention on how good service to science Station Etiologica Napoli was doing. In many cases, service provision is seen by many people that it will become through participation, through participation in EMVSC. The main weakness, and we will see afterwards, is that we lack a definition of services and mainly a costing of the services. Uh, the threat is that there is a little, very few or very little recognition from offering service support. I am recognized for the papers that I publish. I am not recognized for the service I pay uh, for the uh, service support that I provide. Then last, strands, uh, oh, sorry, governance and organization. In some cases, strengths are seen by the governance when it's very clearly de defined and is authoritative. And this leads to other marine biological stations that see governance as a weakness. They do not have a strong governance. They lack a strategy in the marine station. They lack advisory boards, for instance. So there are yin and yang kind of marine biological stations, some of them with a strong governance, some of them with very uh, weak governance. And the threat is the lack of a strategy in marine stations. And in some of the marine biological stations, we lack business plans. So my last slide, and this is my message to you. Sustainability in research infrastructures is like teenage sex. I learned this from Adelino Canario. Everyone talks about it. Nobody knows how to do it. Every now, everyone thinks everyone else is doing it. So everyone claims they are doing it. So we assembled in Assemble Plus to see how we can sustain marine biological stations. We did a general map through this first tier approach. And now I lay leave the floor to Ilaria, who will be showing the context in the context of the European Eric landscape, where do we stand as research service providers? Yeah. So Without anything else to say, now I leave the floor to Ilaria, who should be there. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Yvonne, uh, for this great introduction. And um, so I think uh, uh, you have said so much already about all that have, has been found. And uh, what has happened, uh, as you mentioned, is that uh, we have actually split this kind of analysis into parts. And the first one was this SWOT. And then we went deeper and we made very particular questions to all the marine biological stations. And um, what we obtained um, is, uh, is a, a somewhat a more precise um, quantification of, of all these elements that you have already um, highlighted. So it, we will go through uh, the results of the survey that we conducted and uh, um, I'll just introduce briefly what it was about and uh, the results we, we obtained and um, the main conclusions, recommendations, and then we can talk 
together if there are questions or we want to discuss uh, some things. I think uh, also this will lead um, nicely into the other presentations. So I just wanted to recall uh, uh, what a business model is and, and why it is important to um, somewhat discuss it, even if we are in the context of research, sci science, and so we very well know that business and science are not two terms that very often go together in, in one sentence. But uh, on the other hand, um, a business model, in fact, is only a description of how the resources of any organization are transformed through a process into value, not necessarily a commercial product but value, which could have a, an economic or non-economic social cultural uh, dimension. Uh, so in this respect, we adopted um, this, um, this um, kind of approach to um, define um, what the modus operandi is of the marine biological stations. Perhaps this is a softer term rather than business model, uh, but the exercise will be uh, the same. Uh, so we meant to actually provide an insight into the resilience uh, of this landscape of marine biological stations in Europe and, and beyond, and provide suggestions and recommendations on what could be adopted as a sustainable model for long-term operations. And we have also tried to identify uh, whether uh, these operate uh, these um, research infrastructures we are equating in this exercise, marine bi biological stations to research infrastructures, whether they operate uh, through one specific business model or uh, different ones, and if we had some examples from which we can we could draw some lessons. And in fact, um, we will see uh, that we have singled out some of these stations. So the approach was to, on one hand, to describe this population in general terms, their characteristics, and, and then to visualize the results and to allow some intercomparisons. And in particular, uh, we have adopted um, a methodology that allows us to um, describe these research infrastructures either as research teams, or, re or service providers or balanced research infrastructures, balanced between being a research team and being a service provider. So a research team is typically monodisciplinary and has typically only public stakeholders. It's publicly funded. It has a loose governance. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of additional bodies be besides having a manager and has, is well organized in terms of equipment and projects but human resources are typically on short-term contracts and subject to continuous turnover. And very typically, a research team does not produce uh, financially evaluated products um, and mainly uh, concentrates on the non-financially evaluated products, which are publications, workshops, research projects, etc. Sometimes they have a marketing strategy. The service provider, on the other hand, could be either mono or multidisciplinary uh, in terms of their research team. And uh, they have often a mix of resources in terms of uh, finances between public and private. The government, the government still may be loosely structured and not have uh, many additional uh, bodies advisory bodies, external bodies, etc., And um, the HR, um, actually here there is a mistake, but HR are typically, um, there, typically there is somebody who's appointed to, um, to continue the operation of this uh, uh, infrastructure to guarantee the services. And uh, um, they are more typically producing financial outputs because they sell their services whereas they don't care much about publications. A balanced RI will be something in between, okay? So um, in, in the analysis that we have done, we have considered the average of the population. And then we have taken two examples of the longer standing marine biological stations, the Station Biologique de Roscoff and Station Zoologique Anton Dorn of Naples because 
been there for centuries. And so we take that as a, as a means, as, a, as an evidence that they have been able to sustain their business. We had 22 respondents and this respond, the, the, the variety of respond of, of representation is, uh, is incredible because we have examples of stations that were created in, in the 1800s, as well as stations that were just newly born. And, uh, but they, they do have a lot in common and um, they're all not for profit and 70% of them are public. Uh, only 20% are private entities. <clears throat> um, one interesting question that we um, produced at the, at the very start was to ask what were the objectives of this uh, organi of their organization at the onset, when it was created, what were you created for? What, what did you mean to achieve? And what is it now? How do you see yourself now? Are you, do you still have the same uh, remit? And what we found out is actually that uh, um, some of the items are uh, very, very strong holding like research. Research was and still is the main uh, uh, motive uh, for, for these research stations. And uh, education is also very, very important and it was and still is. Uh, on the other hand, service provision is something that was not uh, there at the onset in many cases, but it's rapidly uh, taken or more than rapidly, it's actually um, recently uh, increasing uh, and to a strong value. Um, on the innovation side, certainly this was not something that was present in many cases in the beginning, but it is um, an interesting uh, avenue for activities in the present days. So, Something that has come out through the surveys that actually education is um, is somewhat something that was not meant to be captured in this uh, study because uh, um, it's not uh, typically uh, a dimension that you would measure out of a research infrastructure or technological core facility. However, it did come out as a strong uh, element uh, that withstand the, the passage of time. And um, Yvonne has, is, is able to explain you very well how that works and why that is the case. But let's just keep the information for now. Um, I'll just keep quite rapidly through the results that Yvonne mentioned already. Um, but just to say that uh, in terms of input, uh, besides, um, uh, this, uh, uh, besides the human resources, uh, we have also looked at the economic resources and there's no surprise here that mostly of them are on public funding. Although uh, the uh, SWOT analysis highlights that not only the, um, the public funding are actually split into different dimensions, which is extremely interesting. It's not just national or European, but also regional funding that come at play in these cases. The marine biological stations have a regional dimension that is extremely important for their sustainability. Um, in terms of research capacity, um, we have found out that actually most, um, actually all the stations but one are multidisciplinary in nature, so they can cater for different uh, strands of science. And um, one reflection that, one concern that we, we, we gather through the, uh, the survey was that uh, um, half of the marine biological stations declared that they do provide services. However, only 12% um, of the revenues are coming from this stream. And this is about sustainability. The fact is that uh, behind the scene, services are provided, but often for free. And so uh, we're, the stations are providing a service to the community, really, not just a, a service for a fee. And there is no economic return. Uh, so that should be somewhat, uh, at some point in time, um, be uh, addressed. As regards the governance, uh, most of the stations have a dedicated management board, uh, but only a few of them have external advisory bodies or 
dedicated bodies to uh, bodies dedicated to specific uh, questions like could be innovation, for example. Um, however, most of them have an internal scientific committee. And, um, and as, as I was saying, the advisory, the innovation committee or the innovation advisory boards are uh, not often present, only in 30% of the cases. As Yvonne was saying, uh, strategic planning can be, um, can be something that the uh, research infrastructures do. Um, however, um, a, por a portion of them just don't have a guide of, of this uh, type. And, uh, and another 20% have something that perhaps is indicating a development strategy, but not extremely formalized. And uh, <clears throat> as I was saying earlier, unfortunately, um, half of the respondent admit that they operate at a loss um, in 13% of the occurrences, and uh, they adopt a cost recovery strategy in 17% of the cases. So in sustainability terms, uh, this is something that should put a flag out there. And uh, most, of the, most of the budget is spent on human resources, 40%, and, uh, and on direct costs. The rest is spent on direct costs, indirect costs. On uh, the human resources, I think uh, Yvonne, Yvonne, you said it all, um, that um, uh, staff is generally composed of scientists uh, at more than half of the capacity and 35% uh, of which is established and 20% 20, 20 of which is early career. So there is a dimension that the um, marine biological stations are fulfilling um, in terms of educating the um, younger generations and um, allowing sustainability in the sense of science itself, of research itself. 25% are technicians and 15% are administration staff. Um, a small portion, uh, as it is normal, is uh, um, managers. Um, most of the people are present uh, on a permanent basis. However, it is not entirely clear how much of their time is dedicated to the um, research infrastructure uh, or some activities that are really pertaining to research infrastructure like service provision. Uh, however, good news is that 40% uh, um, of the permanent staff is dedicated exclusively to service provision for either internal or external users. And that in some cases, there is a bit of a reward for the researchers that are providing services to the community. So we go further and analyze the RI capacity in terms of infrastructure and equipment. And um, again, we're, we're here, we're still on the, under the umbrella of sustainability. So the fact that most of the infrastructure is maintained through public funding and it's owned by the, um, by the, by the organizations, um, is um, something that could be um, nuanced, let's say, um, in different ways. And um, because certainly it is, it becomes a threat uh, if some of these uh, funding run out and um, you are stuck with an equipment that you may not even use. And you don't have other ways to upgrade your facility, whereas the strength of these facilities is actually that they are state of the art, if not beyond. What do they do with uh, with this um, equipment, uh, with these resources that they have, with the teams that they that are in place? Uh, most of the, of the activity is dedicated to research projects, and second comes education. Um, Service provision and training are on the third order, and then they may do some other things like be a policy advice, monitoring, etc.
still on the capacity, uh, we also looked at the networking ability of these arrays, and uh, they agree in most of the cases that being embedded into a wider ecos ecosystem is a strength. And this wider ecosystem could be belonging into a university or a network or a, an association of some form that goes beyond some national boundaries and, or an ERIC, for example, as it is the case um, for um, nearly uh, half of the stations that responded to this survey. And still in the process, uh, uh, what is interesting because it gives us a perspective on what they produce in fact um, is the um, ranking of the uh, key performance indicators um, so if these are key performance indicators um, we use the units of access user satisfaction publications ip annual turnover number of research projects, quality and standard operational procedures, number of service contracts and staff retention. Well, um, it is pretty clear that uh, top priorities are coming in uh, terms of publication, number of research projects. Uh, whereas uh, some other, um, some other um, indicators are, are, are lower in terms of priorities, and uh, um, they just reveal the nature of uh, the research infrastructures that we are analyzing. And in fact, in terms of results, um, we, we know uh, from this uh, perspective that uh, the non-financially evaluated products are the ones that are predominant. However, on the terms, in, in terms of economic uh, products, um, the vast majority of them have a strategic development document and only 40% and 40% of, um, of the stations have a person in charge of developing business. However, sometimes this person may be a person from, a, from the mother organization, from the broader organization. So they may not have so much time to spend for the development of this particular facility or station. Regarding the marketing strategy, we said that um, there is a bit of um, there is a bit of a mixed bag, and um, sixty five percent of the marine stations um, cannot refer the market price of the same service offer. And I think this tells you a lot. Uh, so they're not commercially oriented. Well, I think that is fine. They're therefore something different. However. Um, this creates uh, nuances of pricing uh, for the same service and um, depending perhaps on users, perhaps on relations, perhaps on the date, perhaps on who offers the service. So there is an inconsistency that if you are, if you are putting yourself out as a service provider, you would need to address um, we were talking about um, a, a person dedicated to supporting this development, this kind of development, and a marketing and communication officer is present in about 60% of the marine biological stations, um, a, or a business development officer in half of the cases, because it's a much more specialized person. And um, the... Um, we will see, sorry, I'll go to the next slide because I want to also show that the, um, what the, this output that is produced by the stations is, um, is used in some technology, technology, technology transfer pathways, but uh, in not so many cases. Most cases uh, are collaborative research contract research and consultancy. And um, there are some instances of patents, licensing, spin outs, but this is not a typical case. In fact, now I'm going to wrap it up and I'm sorry because I've bombarded you with data and uh, that's not certainly easy to grasp, but we've tried to summarize what is the average uh, behavior of the uh, marine biological stations. And we've produced this um, graphic 
um, that um, somewhat summarizes all that we have been saying in terms of inputs so of the resources that are at play, the process that is um, utilized to transform this input into the financially evaluated products and non-financially evaluated products. So we've gone through all this, but in summary, this is the picture. And uh, you will see all that is in green is working fine. All that is in red is deserves attention or is not expressed. And in yellow orange is something that is in between that may need reinforcement. On average, um, the uh, marine biological stations in Assemble Plus are multidisciplinary. Um, and uh, the stakeholders are mainly public. There is very little private um, money coming in the stations to support their development. And so this, you can see, is an orange um, arrow that provides input into the process, whereas here, the fact of being multidisciplinary is somewhat a guarantee of being more able to face the diversification of the challenges that they may face. And, uh, and so this input is then utilized by the research infrastructure so um, it's different aspects, the governance, the human resources, the equipment that they have and, and the activities that they do to produce some things. So in terms of, uh, uh, of process, the governance and human resources are quite clear, although the governance may have some um, weaknesses in some instances, whereas it lacks uh, some um, additional capacity. Uh, however, human resources are often in place to support um, the, the, the full operation of the, um, of the research infrastructures. And in terms of output, uh, from the point of view of non-financial output, you can see that everything is in green, whereas uh, from the point of view of financial outputs, some activities are not expressed, like creation of spin-offs or provision of training. Um, we have created the same picture only for only considering the examples of those longer, longer standing marine stations of Station Biologique de Roscoff and Station Ecologica di Napoli. Um, and what you can see quite evidently is that um, even though uh, the input is somewhat uh, uh, similar, the process is actually stronger and uh, the output uh, expresses all the um, all the possibilities actually that we have uh, provided. So both financial and non-financial outputs are completely expressed. So in conclusion, what we, we can say is that uh, the marine biological stations operate uh, following a research team approach rather than a service provision approach. Now, if we consider that these were um, um, under, understood uh, as research infrastructures, uh, perhaps um, something needs to shift in order to comply with this um, mission, if this is the mission. Um, however, with respect to a typical research team, as it was described in the literature by other authors, they are multidisciplinary and the human resources are much better balance between permanent and temporary staff than a typical research team would have. So there is, you know, they're not just a typical research team. They are similar because, especially because of the output. Um, in fact, the non-financially evaluated products remain the main priority for these entities uh, as it is typical for a research team. And service uh, provision and the development of spin-offs are somewhat represented in this population, although not everywhere. Um, in the longest standing cases, uh, we have a, a more robust sustainability strategy that is developed also on paper, also in the governance, also in the bodies that advise uh, um, the, um, the management, uh, also in the um, program of activities. And the production of financially evaluated output is actually um, large. 
they um, may have may even be embedded into uh, regional clusters, um, clusters of research industry policy, meaning triple helix kind of clusters. And um, education, however, remains an important activity across the ecosystem. And so this is important. So we conclude with some recommendations. Um, certainly they are not the recipe for um, surviving, but just some advice on specific advice uh, based on what we have seen so far, so far, so far. On governance, uh, we encourage the establishment of a strong governance and management team and a realignment or an alignment of the mission uh, towards the um, European needs for innovation in order to enable those pathways that are uh, leading to technology and knowledge exchange and the intensification of the research output uptake, which is um, something that is strongly advocated by the um, research framework programs past and present. On networks, um, we also would recommend that the stations strengthen their networks and consider an integration process into a structured and wide ecosystem if they are not in that position already. So as to increase their visibility, increase the number of users, actually diminish their costs in this uh, respect and leverage stronger collaborations and increase the opportunity to be involved into relevant uh, projects at the European level, for example, more, more widely and provide a more secure market for a different set of activities and output types that they may produce. Also, as a general assumption, and you know, we may discuss, uh, this is a philosophical discussion, whether being specialized or, me, or, or being less specialized is a recipe for success. But as a general assumption, a balance of activities between multidisciplinary uh, research activities and service provision and um, a varied portfolio of resources from the technical and scientific perspective. And all of this has certainly the potential, at least the potential to increase the ability to address the societal challenges, which may vary. And we've seen how rapidly they may vary in these years and to gain funding streams that, that actually can you know, support your sustainability. And in the end, um, we recommend also, if um, sustainability is important, that strengthening the um, user community engagement through a strategy and the implementation of that strategy also supported by um, service or pricing policies and um, the presence of a person, personnel that is dedicated to that marketing activity could be a good, uh, a good suggestion. And with that, uh, I think I have provided an assist for uh, the next presentations by Marco. And uh, I thank you. And uh, I think we can open the floor for discussion if this is correct, Yvonne. I don't know if I've consumed the time. Thanks, Yvonne. Oh, thanks, Ilaria. Oh, <laughs> yourself. <laughs> uh, we are uh, a little bit uh, ahead of the schedule, but we have a good 10 minutes uh, for the audience. If there is any question in the audience, uh, either for Ilaria or for myself. I do not know whether there is anybody in the chat. I see one hand, yes. but I cannot see who does it belong to. Ah, Juanjo. Juanjo, hey, please. Uh, hello, Yvonne. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I have a very general question for uh, you and uh, Ilaria. Uh, to my understanding, it's a little bit difficult the way you explained uh, to connect the uh, European research infrastructure to this is sort of a station network. In the first place, I have a series of very fast questions. In terms of budgeting, you are running with 80% of fund, public funding, which to me is a surprise because you reduce to the member fee to something like 4%. So it's difficult to understand 
how you can manage sustainability, sustainability in the long term. Unless this part of this member fee is already included in the public uh, fund. You will answer me later. Second thing is, uh, I lack an overall coordination of all the stations because it seems to me that at the level of the region, you have a very good coordination between uh, transnational regions, which is very good. But at the level of the whole organization, I don't know, you have set up lines of action which affect all of them. Otherwise, it looks like the research is focused on a regional aspect, not on an overall aspect on science. In terms of industry, uh, I am also, I don't know how you handle with industry. You talk a lot about service provided, but I don't know if the industry is engaged or not, and how the industry is engaged simply to access or to provide uh, some uh, uh, data or to provide some technology or to have joined venturing technology is something which is absolutely unclear to, to my understanding. Knowing that you are a powerful uh, a priori a distributed research infrastructure, which means a lot of complication. That apparently you saw very well at the regional level and I don't know how you solve it at the overall level as a big uh, European organization that provide guidelines to critical topics in terms of biology research. The other thing, and I have been recently in Canada talking about these topics is, what is the aim at the end of a public research infrastructure? We should provide data and to do research at the same time, or we provide information that the others, the users, stakeholders, scientists, universities, etc., they do the research and we help the research of both things. The conclusion in Canada was that our primary aim is to provide information that the users can produce research and knowledge and information. But also, if you don't do at the level of the station research, it's catastrophic because you can't progress. It's impossible to, to progress. And I have many other questions, but <laughs> with, this too, with this is enough. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's for enough that. for a couple of days. <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't know if you can give me an overall picture of her. Uh, Italia, wanna, yeah, I can take a part uh, and then you can take others. Um, I just wanted to reflect on the issue that you raised on the budget to being uh, public and the membership fees, etc. I think, uh, and also in equating, I mean, the first um, uh, aspect you put down on the table was about equating these marine biological stations to research infrastructures. And uh, this is a bit of an assumption uh, because uh, the project was an, infra in was an integrating activity and these um, marine biological stations somewhat aren't aspiring to um, become research infrastructures, okay, whether per se or within a broader umbrella like EMBRC or other uh, research infrastructures, but because this is their inspiration, this is their aspiration, it was a way to uh, somewhat put a, a mirror um, in front of them, of them and, and, see, and say, you know, a research infrastructure is based on these elements and uh, you are, um, you look like this. So if you want to get here, well, you, you can consider some activities. And this was, was an, a propedeutic exercise. It's an educational tool that we've tried to develop. The whole SWOT analysis was about training the mind uh, of, of people to just thinking along those lines. And then the questionnaire was about being a bit more precise and, and describe how a process of transformation of the input into output uh, looks like and what are the outputs that are pertinent to, to a research infrastructure, et cetera. How's the governance organized, et cetera. Um, instead, for what you, you're mentioning about the budget uh, and whether the budget is, uh, is made of the membership fees or not. Well, in this case, the, these marine biological stations do not have membership fees. So they're not research infrastructures as an ERIC. And the EMBRC ERIC was not part of the survey. 
So this, uh, whatever was uh, um, 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 narrated as, uh, as budget, as public budget comes from uh, um, their subsidies at the national level uh, or uh, projects, uh, but I guess mainly at the national and regional level as uh, Yvonne has, uh, has shown. Uh, then I could go on a lot, uh, but uh, I just want to, I would let, I would like to um, have also Yvonne come in in this um, 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 understanding or discussing the, the, the regional aspect of the industry links. Um, but I, I think that the question that you put in the end is a philosophical and extremely important one. I also, this, which is about, you know, are we, pro, are the research infrastructures providing the uh, services and the um, equipment uh, or are they doing the research just in a nutshell? And uh, I had a conversation with uh, Carlo Rizzuto recently, who's the father of the regulation and uh, <laughs> of the research infrastructures, et cetera. And, um, and I, I, I said, you know, the regulation says that we're here to provide services. And he says, no, well, no, that is not the case. We're actually here also to do research. Uh, this is a main remit of the research infrastructure. So uh, I suggested that in view of the um, uh, revision of the uh, EGERIC, uh, of the regulation, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, that the commission is um, carrying out, that we accompany the regulation. We will not change the regulation, but we accompany the regulation with a description of what is meant by some words, because I think in my experience and from your question, I gather we have a similar one. Um, some um, terms, some elements, some articles are um, have misled us into thinking that we're here only to provide services, that we cannot do an economic business. And also on this, I had a conversation and he assured me it's not the case. So I think this deserves a clarification, not just in this workshop, but at a very high level in order for, for us to be clear on what we can or cannot do and where there is a merit for us or not. Yeah, I, I, yes, I just want to jump in. Uh, I, I agree with everything that Ilaria has said. For you, Juanjo, to, to, uh, th there are two things here. One thing is EMBS, Eric, the big European research infrastructure, and the other thing is the marine biological stations. And this was an exercise done towards the marine biological stations themselves wow. as marine biological stations and not as an Eric research infrastructure, which uh, changes a lot the thing. Huh? And then when it comes with the collaboration with industry, what we are seeing is that we do have this collaboration with the industry at the regional level. But when we come to the ERIC level, in yeah. which we are working through transnational access uh, provision, the things are more complicated because many of the, in, in our field, the, most of the industry are very small industry and they are not willing to go to a country where they do not understand the language. They do not understand the process. They want to stay regional. Well, Ivan, I understand the world well, very, very, very short, but the marine mother, all the marine bio biological stations are members of the EMBRC or not? Not in this project. You, you say, ah, not in the, no, I'm not talking about the project, I'm talking about... No, 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 they are, they are not, they are not, they are not. No. There are many marine stations which are not members of EMBRC. Okay, this clarifies a lot of things. Yeah. Thank you very much. Adelino, please. I'm very quick because we have to come to the second. Okay, part. I'll be I'll be quick. It's more uh, maybe maybe more a comment. One maybe about the, the things you said. Of course, the, one of the problems of this kind of analysis is that uh, there is a big variation in priorities, in conditions, and so on in different places. Um, uh, you know, even in terms of the economies of the different places and, and basically how people uh, uh, see uh, the marine stations. But having said that, and, and jumping a bit on to uh, what, uh, what Ilaria uh, presented, um, some, you know, uh, some years ago, we did a, a small, uh, I mean, not, not, not with the data that you have or anything like that, but just a small, 
uh, economic analysis of how marine stations could impact, at least in our case, uh, could impact uh, in terms of, uh, of the economy, or, or let's say how, uh, whether they would they, they are beneficial or not. And essentially, the conclusion was that for each euro invested, you should get you get at least two euros out. And 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 that is not just based on on money. It's based on the on the various non-monetized aspects that uh, Ilaria mentioned, including training, including you know basically knowledge transfer, which sometimes is not uh, quantified, and a series of other things. So uh, you know, I think there is, uh, of course, questions about how effective uh, marine stations are in passing on this kind of information uh you know basically to the to the policymakers it's it's easier in some places than others and of course for example i can say that in our case here is not that easy because tourism is 80% of the regional economy and in fact a, a, a colleague of mine here at university is an economist and he wrote a small article in a regional newspaper and he compared tourism Although this is a kind of people would uh, jump when they hear this kind of thing, but they compare tourism with eucalyptus plantations that dry out everything around it um, because it has tremendous consequences at different levels. Okay, it has a positive consequence because it's it's a bit like a, an export uh, business, and so that brings uh, revenue. But in terms of the social economic in the region, it may have significant effects. I can say, for example, the Algarve, uh, compared to the rest of the country, has lower paid jobs, has as lower percentage of people with uh, degrees, uh, has more dropout uh, kids from school because they basically go and, and find jobs in hotels and this and that. So there is a series of things. And of course, one of our roles here is to try to uh, change this kind of uh, uh, of situation. You know, it's it's difficult, but it has to be done, and you have to continue trying to do it. Basically, it's a way of diversifying the economy and, and putting some other uh, tone into it. So it was just uh, a comment. I think this kind of um, analysis is very important to provide also arguments for for you know for for different reasons. In our case, this is one reason. Thanks, Adelino. So in the interest of time, uh, let's continue with what I call the second part of the workshop. So it's the experts that come from outside our small world. So we have first uh, Marco, Marco Galeotti. I ask you to share your screen. Marco comes from uh, EMSO Eric, and he is working in a European project that is called Enrich, and he will be talking about how are we able to strengthen our relationship with industry. Yeah, so Marco, the platform yes. is yours. Thank you, Ivan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Ivan and the Assemble Plus project for the opportunity to present their reach uh, at your conference. Uh, my name is Marco Galeotti and I am the program and industry relations officer at MSWARIC. Uh, MSWARIC is the European multidisciplinary seafloor and water column observatory and aims to explore the oceans in order to gain a better understanding of phenomena happening within and below them and to explain the critical role that these phenomena play in the broader earth, earth system. Uh, for example, climate change, geohazard, and ocean acidification are just a few of the critical challenges that HEMSO helps to uh, tackle with its activities. But uh, um, yeah, okay. Um, today, um, I would like to briefly introduce the Enrich project that has been funded in 2019 to establish European network for industrial liaison and contact officers uh, engage with pan-European research infrastructure, including uh, S3 landmarks and projects, as well as other relevant world-class research infrastructure of European interest. 
The project is coordinated by the European Spallation Source, uh, the world's most powerful neutron source for interdisciplinary research. And we have a total of 11 beneficiaries that include six ESPRI partners that are ESS, ESRF, Eatris, EMSO, Clarin, and Stazione Zoologica Anton Doran. Whereas the industry liaison office uh, selected for geographical and sectorial diversity are five and are DTI from Denmark, CDTI from Spain, uh, Big Science Sweden, Ilonet from the Netherlands, and uh, WPT from Holland. Uh, but um, to prepare you for the next slides, uh, for the next uh, uh, content, I need to clarify before and the actors involved in our network, as defined by the European Commission, the industry liaison officers are officers officially appointed by the member states to stimulate collaboration among the national industry and the international research infrastructures, whereas the industry contact officers our research researchers staff in charge of developing business relations. But um, because I've reached aimed at establishing an European network of ILOS and ICOS engaged with European research infrastructure, the consortium and the project has been built to maximize the collaboration between these two figures. All the phases of the project from the design on have been designed as community driven with a strong relationship between ILOS and ICOS that have participated in leading all the tasks. In addition, uh, to maximize the impact of our activities, we have also covered all the S3 scientific domains and all the industrial sectors, taking into consideration the characteristic of all parts of the European innovation ecosystem. Um, the multidisciplinary approach and uh, the commitment to co-design the activities with all the stakeholders from the get-go and the success of the action carried out so far have attracted a growing number of partners so that the number reached 502 in March 22, uh, 2022. And this is one of the main results of the project to create a very large community of innovation brokers around the common objective of exploiting the innovation potential of the European research infrastructure, building fruitful and long-standing relationship with industry. Um, as a consequence of this success, uh, the Enrich Network has already been recognized of, as one of the more influential actors in the European innovation ecosystem and has been cited in the latest as we wrote on business section, consolidation of the European RI landscape and in, in the final remarks as a consortium that can have an important social economic impact. But moving to the findings and the outcomes of the project, I would like to start with the results of the service we carry out at the beginning of the project and then we have been the basis for all the derivables that came after. Uh, among all the facts we found, we discovered that there is already a good alignment between the services offered by Arise and the needs of the industry. What industry usually asks for is access to the facilities for using the cutting edge technology offered by the Arise labs for testing of new devices or validation of quality standards. On the other end, emerged that only half of the EU Arise we interviewed employ an industry contact officer, and only 60% of them have a strategy for working with industry. In addition, we found that only uh, Arise with an operational budget, uh, uh, annual budget of over 5 million have stable collaboration with the industry. And from this picture, it's clear that NRI and industry are ready to work together, but they strongly need support to kick off new relationships and uh, to make them long-standing. 
But um, starting from this evidence, um, and which has developed a series of strategy to give answers to all the aspects that emerged as barriers to the collaboration between rice and the industry. The first and most important is the strategy to exploit the innovation potential of EU rice. And it paves the way for the future enriched network, but um, I will say more about that in the next slide. In addition to that, we define a strategy for every industry collaboration, for training ILOs and ICOs, for the organization of brokerage bands, and for the optimization of the performances. But uh, going deeper into the strategy to exploit uh, the innovation potential of a rise, uh, five key uh, initiatives have been identified. Uh, the first one is uh, to establish a pan-European ICO and ILO network. And uh, actually we created a network based on a hub and spoke model with an European hub in the center that I will describe later. Uh, the second point is the adoption of a set of core competencies for ICOs and ILOs. And we define it <clears throat> a clear set of competencies and the need to have an industry contact office in each array. The third point is that each array should review and implement specific key action and 17 key areas with recommended action are defined in the deliverables. The fourth point is building a strategic alliance relationship with the most relevant stakeholders in the European innovation ecosystem. And the last one is to develop an European ERI innovation strategy, in particular in relation to uh, the rule of ERI in the ERI system. <clears throat> but focusing on the first point of the list, that is the model we have developed for the Enrich European Hub, that is supposed to be a management office in charge of coordinating the support actions like communication, marketing, training, event planning, and knowledge exchange strategies. The app should have a governance board composed both of a rise and industry representatives to have a work program always aligned with the needs of both sectors. For this reason, the relations uh, with all the main actors in the innovation ecosystem uh, should, should be ongoing in an attempt to adapt on an annual basis the strategies we have developed so far the straighting path and the communication material following the changes in the ecosystem. Uh, but we really strong, we strongly believe that the Enrich Network could be a game changer in the next future to have an open innovation environment where industry and rice work together on a regular basis, making the most out of the cutting edge technologies that our world-class laboratories de develop regularly. Uh, opening new market, thanks to the breakthrough discoveries and progressive advancement in knowledge, could be much easier in the next future, uh, thanks to the Enrich Network, that is our main aim. Uh, and that was my, my last slide, so thank you very much for the attention. Thanks a lot, Marco. Uh, we will take the questions at the end after the three speakers. So yes. now is the floor for uh, Immaculada Figueroa from the Ministry of Science of the of Spain, and she's the responsible for the research infrastructures in Spain. So at the very big level, she's my very big boss. Immaculada, that's it's your turn now. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us to be here with you. It is a pleasure to join you, good friends from very, very, very different uh, uh, profi profiles or, and uh, meetings because we are connected in many, many ways. My ideas requested by the organizers is to give you a, simply uh, um, a, a vision of how we manage uh, at the the level of uh, the, 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 the ministerial, uh, 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 the representatives of these uh, research infrastructures, um, the, priorities, the prioritization, so the road mapping exercise in order to, to de determine to in, in which initiatives uh, participate uh, and giving you a, uh, an idea about how we do it in Spain in particular, 
and how we link this with the international, the national um, aspect uh, uh, in the middle, with the European ones and with the regional ones. That in the cases of Spain is completely um, necessary because this is the the how the our state is constituted, constituted, and it is very important the role of uh, of all the different elements. Um, if we start uh, with uh, with the, the the regulation or the or the legal um, uh, um, framework, um, the all the activities related with the, with research and innovation in uh, in Spain, it is uh, it is uh, organized. Uh, we have a, a special law, the law, the law of, uh, of science, that it is uh, pro, uh, the, today. In the Parliament for the for a, an update for approval of of uh, an update in which we have been working in the last uh, period. That is it is low uh, the the ones that it is framework all the activities related with uh, uh, research and innovation in Spain at all of these levels that I have uh, already mentioned to you regional national everything it is under this joining all the effort of the system of um, uh, uh, Spanish system of uh, science technology and innovation and covering uh, many, many different aspects from the human resources uh, to the institu institutional uh, aspect to um, the more strategic uh, relation uh, related with policies, open, open access, open science, etc. Um, in this framework, we have uh, two uh, tools. The tool, the, the main tool is the Estrategia Española de Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación, the Spanish strategy for science, technology and innovation that we develop uh, in, a, in a coordinated way, uh, way together with the, uh, the regional governments. In Spain, we have um, a council or a board of, uh, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for science, technology and innovation policy that it is composed at, uh, by the representative of the, of the minister, ministries involved in activities related with research and innovation and also with the representation of all the regional governments that, um, that uh, are in Spain. Uh, the president of this council is the, is the minister of the Ministry of Science, and the vice president is in a, in a rotating way, a rotatory way, uh, the representatives of the regional governments. And uh, in this, in this, uh, this is the, the top uh, governing board that it is uh, dealing with all the aspects related with the uh, strategy and planning of uh, the activity of research and innovation in, in Spain. Uh, something that is really important and you see here is that uh, our uh, national, uh, our uh, state strategy or national strategy is totally aligned with the European one. In this sense, as you see, it follows exactly the same uh, timing that, uh, for the, that we have for the, in this case, for Horizon Europe. So the strategy is covering the period 21-27, the same like the Horizon Europe strategy. And we try, uh, because this is the, the decision, to, to have an alignment of uh, all the activities that we uh, do in Spain uh, together with the policies and the strategies that are defined also by us at European level. So this is the, the, this is the, the link between uh, the, the different level, the regional go, uh, governments and the regional strategies and also the European uh, ones. Uh, for the for the development of this strategy, we then uh, have the state plan for scientific and, ten, uh, and technical research and innovation. That is um, the the, um, uh, the document in, where, uh, in which we uh, gather all the different activities that we are going to develop in all these priorities lines that are defined in the strategy. In this case, we we uh, cover a periods of uh, four years, uh, three years, sorry, and uh, and the, the first one is uh, uh, the plan estatal de investigación científica técnica y de innovación. Uh, for the period 21 and 23, in which uh, that is the, is the tool that it is um, uh, putting in place, all the activities that we are going to put in uh, to, 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 to develop uh, in order to uh, fulfill with, uh, with what we have established in the strategy. 
the, the, the Council of, 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 for, the, for Science, Technology and Innovation Policy is also responsible not only of the definition and the inclusion of all the, of the, the different views uh, at national level of the interests of regions and, um, and national governments, taking that in the, at national governments, it's not only the Ministry of Science, but it's also the, minister, the sectoral minister, ministries that have some competences in research and innovation that participate also in this uh, committee, in this council. And uh, it is also this, uh, this body, this, um, uh, uh, the, re the responsible for the monitoring of all the activities and also for the evaluation uh, that uh, or the, the strategy and the plan in order to um, verify that what was established uh, it is uh, it is uh, done or we are developing and also to in, in some cases to determine if it's if it's needed some additional uh, revision of the strategy and the, and the plans in order to to, to cover as aspect that at, at the moment in which it was um, drafted was not possible to include. In terms of uh, the whole Im image of our system, uh, we have these two levels that I mentioned uh, is the European um, strategic, strategic framework that it is uh, the, uh, the basis, no? Because finally it is, uh, it is, um, uh, the the frame in which we uh, develop our our uh, activity we are what we do is trying to uh, contribute to the european strategy since um, uh, national and regional uh, level taking into consideration of course what are the interests of our uh, scientific community uh, companies and uh, and uh, and set, uh, national sectors in general in this sense, we, we, we are very well aligned, as I mentioned, with the Horizon Europe during this per period. And, uh, and then we have, uh, as it is uh, here reflected, the Spanish strategy, the state plan. And together with the state plan, or contributing to this state plan, uh, we have all the regional science, uh, science, technology, and innovation plans that are coming from the different gover uh, regional governments. In terms of funding uh, of uh, all of this activity, uh, we are we, we consider also all, all the uh, all the work that is done in the in the context of the smart uh, smart specialization specialization strategies that the, uh, the the regions are contributing to the to the fund and in fact the Spanish strategy for science technology and innovation we can call we can say that it is the the restress the the the, the research and innovation is, um, uh, a smart strategy uh, 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 smart specialization sorry, strategy sorry sorry smart specialization strategy at the national level so it is uh, composed of all the all of all of these exercises that have been done at the, at the regional level in terms of funding uh, and also in this uh, frame is, uh, framework it's very important also to consider as uh, it is uh, here uh, reflected uh, that we are using cohesion fund policy funds the cohesion policy funds are, 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 are utilized in the the funding of all the activities related to research and innovation uh, and we when when we talk about these funds we are considering the structural funds but we are, and investment funds but we are also considering at this moment the, the funding that is, uh, cami uh, is coming from the EU generation, next generation of funds and the, the recovery and resilient, and resilient plan. So it is a, a well embedded system covering uh, all the different aspects and taking into consideration for the definition and for the monitoring and for the development, all the different, uh, the, these different uh, level of actuations that are enhanced of the different uh, level of governance that we have in, in Spain. For this uh, purpose, uh, uh, we have, of, co of course, this uh, smart specialization strategies, but the, we, we sign specific um, agreements with the regional governments in order to, to promote the, the innovation and the, the research and innovation in, in, the region, in the regions in order to go ahead with this uh, and, and put in place this, this money or, or offer this money for the, the activity related with research and innovation. And we have a, a network, the network, the Red IMAS de Masi, the network of uh, uh, research, uh, development, and innovation that, was, that is established like uh, 
for the strategic coordination between these uh, regional uh, governments and the general uh, the, uh, the state government in order to mobilize all the resources uh, that are available at, at, at the different level in order to join efforts and to have a better development of the lines that we have included in our strategy and that for sure are contributing to the uh, European policies and, uh, and the European strategies. In this context, uh, just to say that for, 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 for the government, for the, for the ministry, it's very important uh, the role of the research infrastructures. There is a clear consensus at, uh, at uh, European level, but also at a national uh, level, that if we want to, to be competitive and we, we want to have a, a role to play in this uh, globalized uh, world, we need to, uh, to be supported in this uh, uh, big infrastructure. Of course, it's very important all the uh, all the aspects related with um, with human resources higher education and the and and to um, and to strengthen uh, all of our research institution and in this uh, in this sense uh, for 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 having a a, a solid uh, structure for our research and innovation system we need to have a first class research infrastructures research infrastructures in this sense Spain is uh, well uh, in, uh, involved in all the activities uh, related with research infrastructure, in particular the unit I am, uh, I am uh, steering. Uh, it is the ones that it is uh, working with the research infrastructure in Europe through the different uh, uh, committees and, and, uh, and groups that are uh, working with uh, research infrastructure. How we build this uh, ecosystem of research infrastructures? Uh, we have uh, at national level, we have, uh, of course, the, the big uh, research centers that are uh, belonging to, to the Ministry of Science and Innovation. Here you have the Research Council, the Spanish Research Council, CSIG. We have the CIMAT. The CIMAT is the research, council, is the, the research center for um, um, energy and environment. We have the, the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias, that it is the the research center that is uh, dealing with uh, the research in, in um, astronomy and space. And then we have uh, the Instituto de Salud Carlos III, that it is, um, in this case, uh, the Instituto de Salud Carlos III, we will see afterwards, it, it is it has a double uh, role to play. In one play, in one sense, in one sense is a research performing organization like the previous one, but it's also funding agency. The, research, the Instituto de Salud Carlos III is, all, is also um, funding uh, the activities at the different level in, in Spain in the domain of uh, health. Uh, Spain, um, um, in, in a moment, in, a, in the past, decided to use this, the, the research infrastructures to build. Uh, to, to strengthen the, the, ter the territorial co cohesion of Spain, taking into, taking into consideration the special distribution we have and uh, joining the efforts of the national governments with the regional governments in order to, to build up a strong network of research infrastructures that are um, sp spread along the territory and covering all the scientific domains. And this is what we call ICTS, that are um, uh, uh, unique uh, infrastructure for science, technology, and, and technology. And in the, in the top of the, uh, the pyramid of the, our ecosystem, of course, are the European uh, research infrastructures, mainly uh, governed by ESFRI, in which uh, we participate. And that is the, the body that is, serves as, as incubator for all of these activities. So this is uh, the, 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 the scheme we have. In, the, in this uh, the foundation of the, the pyramid is not only the research centers. It is very important to know that uh, not, all we, not always we are participating uh, from the, the research, the, this uh, research uh, performance organization in the, in the infrastructure, but all the universities at, uh, and, uh, and um, technical centers um, uh, uh, distributed along, the, along in Spain is, uh, are also contributing. This is, uh, for instance, the case in the case of EMBRC. In relation with the funding agencies, we have three funding agencies. We have the CDTI. The CDTI is, is our innovation agency. It is the one that is, uh, was mentioned by my colleague from Enso. It's uh, as, uh, one of the uh, partners in the in the RIT, uh, project. CDTI is responsible for the activities related uh, to fund um, innovation. 
and to promote the participation of our companies in all the in all the in all the uh, European projects. And in particular, there is a, sp a special group that it is dealing with all the participation in this uh, in these initiatives that are the research infrastructures. In, in both sides, in both sense, in, in one way, they are providing resources uh, in terms of companies that are uh, have the capacity to develop the technology that is needed in the research infrastructure, but, so, but also in terms of uh, obtaining some return for, for, uh, from our participation in this, in this research infrastructure through contracts uh, to our industry. Then we have the, the Agencia Estatal, the State Agency for Research, that is the... It is, uh, the, the... Uh, sorry, Inmaculada, we need to hurry up. Oh, sorry. Okay. So this is for the, for the research, and then, as I mentioned, the Instituto de Salud Carlos III. Uh, well, I think that we are all of us in the same, uh, in the same, uh, with good knowledge about the infrastructure. So, so only uh, here I wanted to say that we do have three main actors in the in the field of infrastructure. We have the member states that are covering a big part of the of the cake in terms of funding because they are covering the all the all the all the cost of construction and oper operation of this infrastructure. We have uh, then the commission that uh, through the framework programs. They are contributing also, and it's very important the, the role they, they play in order to establish these um, seed funds that are helping to develop many different strategic activities, not only um, supporting the research infrastructure, but also other activities that are pushing for, the, for a stronger ecosystem. And of course, ESPRI, like uh, the, the leverage, uh, leverage both, uh, both parts. Uh, well, you know that the that the the main tool of ESPRI is the the roadmap, and uh, and uh, here you have why is needed the ESPRI in order to join efforts. Here I wanted to to give you some uh, some flavor of uh, our national um, infrastructure um, uh, system. We have an a uh, an, uh, document in which everything is uh, is gathering, and I have uh, I, I left here the the the, the, the link. And here you have the map with all the different uh, infrastructure that I mentioned distributed along the territory and covering all the domains in order to have a, for you to have an idea of um, how this system is um, constructed constructed the reason uh, um, for the for the map of the unique science and technology infrastructures was uh, I, as i mentioned the intention of uh, having a, a tool for this uh, cohesion in, at the territorial level in spain Joining an effort from the regional and the national governments, and uh, I would like just to mention that uh, the, the the processing which follow we follow in in Spain for the establishment of the the, the roadmap and also the, our contribution to the European roadmap, the ESPRI roadmap, is that we never evaluate at national level the the scientific quality of the proposals. Uh, we consider that if in a moment ESPRI Decides to include some projects in the in the roadmap is because um, the evaluation has proved that is uh, that is fulfilling all the requirements that are imposed by S3, and we we are completely aligned with this decision. So we are not uh, when we decide to to do to go for the roadmap in Spain, what we evaluate previous the the the, the decision of which projects support and, and in order to, to, to send to them uh, letters of uh, support for, for them to, to, to have the, to be eligible for, for being um, part of the proposal to the S3 roadmap is also only those aspects that are related with uh, national uh, criteria. So we see what is the, the uniqueness of the scientific project, but from the point of view, national point of view, what is the level of internationalization that this project is going to bring to our institution? What is the position of our national institutions in the project? And what are the possibilities of this institution to attract uh, headquarters or not to Spain? Uh, of course, what is the participation of our ICTS? That is uh, something important because it is the, the, the mean for internationalization of our national research infrastructures. We see the, the, the aspect of users, managers, uh, but from this uh, point of view, always, uh, always with this uh, approach to the national system, we see the financial maturity of the proposal and the innovation uh, uh, in terms of what is the industrial return that we are going to obtain of, of participating in this proposal. And uh, in terms of um, access and, and data and data, we are, uh, we are always uh, evaluating what is the, um, the link of this proposal with ESPRI. 
Um, in relation, just to give you a, a, some numbers, in the roadmap uh, 2021, Spain is participating in 12 projects and 27 landmarks. We have three statutory seats in Spain, like what you should like to do. Uh, uh, and we, ha we have the, the big uh, um, uh, principal notes of uh, many of other infrastructures uh, all way, all also based in, in Spain. And for sure, we, we are contributing to all the distributed infrastructure with, the, with very important notes uh, distributed in, in Spain. The funding scheme. The funding scheme, we follow a variable geometry for funding. Of course, we are uh, we are conscious of, of the, the the need of this of this sustainability that is required for our infrastructures, and uh, but there is not a, a, a unique um, uh, scheme. We we follow different approaches. Uh, there are different um, components that, that are uh, needed to fund. One is the contribution, this uh, uh, financial contribution that is necessary for running the organization and in which uh, that, uh, to which we commit when we decided to join. We have to also to, to fund the maintenance and upgrading of the national notes. notes. And we, in, in another cases for the construction, for instance, we are contributing also with in-kind contribution with developments so, uh, at national level that are contributing to the construction of the big infrastructures. Uh, the schemes, as I mentioned, are very different. And, uh, and it is also related with, uh, with, the, with the structure of our country. Uh, so we have uh, several lines in the state budget for covering infrastructures. We have around 150 million euros per year for covering the, the contribution to these big infrastructures. Uh, and, and, um, but we are not alone. The Ministry of Science and Innovation is not alone. We also count with the support of the sectoral ministries that are contributing, depending on, the, of the, on their interest to, all, to some of the infrastructure, depending on the, the scientific domain. Uh, of course, we, are, we use the, the funds coming from the state funding agencies that I mentioned. Inmaculada, we need to finish because Eleni has to move to another meeting. Okay. So, well, because this is what I wanted to say. So, we, the, the scheme is uh, to, to try to gather the, the budget from the different uh, uh, resources and, and try to find the best way to contribute depending on the, on the instrument, on the, on the infrastructure that we want to contribute. So, thanks a lot, Inma. So, now it's the time for Eleni. Uh, what's this new thing that is coming? So good afternoon from Brussels and uh, many thanks for uh, inviting Digimara to your conference today and in particular to this uh, session because it is uh, very relevant with our uh, new initiative uh, regarding smart specialization and sustainable blue economy. So I will share a presentation with you. Uh, so give me just a couple of uh, seconds. Um, That's what? it. Perfect. Is it in, sli in, in slideshow now? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, um, so I was I was uh, thanking you because indeed uh, it's an opportunity uh, today to to discuss together with you and uh, your stakeholders on uh, on sustainable blue economy and how uh, the different blue economy stakeholders can take let's say the advantages of the smart specialization strategies of the regional authorities in order to 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 go uh, further to innovative projects on the sustainable blue economy and on different maritime sectors uh, so um, in the concept of the new approach for the sustainable blue economy, which has been published by the European Commission and in particular by DG Mare uh, last uh, year, um, uh, we tried to, to, to align uh, the, the priorities, the different activities in the blue economy sectors uh, to a sustainable way and to align them to the uh, priorities and the access of the European Green Deal for greening the economy. And actually, we find this very significant and very important because uh, according to the figures uh, in the blue economy sectors, as they are described in, in the uh, blue economy reports um, um, published by European Commission every year, it, there's still enormous blue economy growth potential to be tapped and there are high 
uh, numbers in terms of uh, gross uh, value added, but also in terms of the uh, employment in different blue economy sectors. So through this new communication, uh, we try to, to support the recovery of the sector uh, because of the COVID pandemic, but also in order to face other challenges like, for example, the climate crisis and going further to more sustainable and more resilient socioeconomic models in the typical way of, of seeing the sustainability as the intersection uh, among the environmental sustainability, the social sustainability, and also the economic sustainability. And uh, for the implementation of this new approach coming from the European Commission, uh, we found, we identified the smart specialization strategies as a key enabler for doing so, and by specifically focusing on how we can build uh, interregional uh, partnerships with, uh, let's say, innovative potential and uh, smart, as we say, value chains on different bull economy sectors. Uh, around Europe, uh, more than uh, 40 regions have identified uh, marine uh, economy, uh, uh, different maritime economies, different sectors of maritime economy uh, as, let's say, very high in their agendas when drafting their smart specialization strategies. And in particular, those topics have found to be the fisheries, the aquaculture, the marine renewable energies, the coastal and maritime tourism, and the blue biotechnology. So uh, speaking of, uh, let's say, smart specialization strategies and uh, how uh, the blue economy sectors can be further uh, developed in the concept of their smart specialization strategies, in the concept of innovation uh, under this, this uh, uh, let's say, framework of, of smart specialization, let me please give you, let's say, um, a very short description of this concept in case that some of or people from the audience are not very familiar with that. So uh, the concept of the smart specialization is not something new. It's something which has been introduced by the European Commission uh, a couple of years ago, and in particular in 2017 as, let's say, uh, a key approach for starting a bottom-up uh, uh, entrepreneurial discovery in the countries and more particular in the regions as the key uh, administrative authorities uh, to, to take the benefits from the different financial uh, tools available by the European Commission. And actually, that's what they did, the, the regional authorities, uh, a couple of years ago, trying to, to, to let's say, uh, kicking up a, a, a bottom-up approach, a discussion with the different stakeholders, but which stakeholders in particular? The stakeholders, which are the parts of what we call the credible helix, and this is what we call the helix of innovation, and in particular, the research at academia, the businesses, which means uh, private sector, either industry or small and medium enterprises or startups, and the public administration, and of course, the citizens, the society, either as group of, uh, of citizens or NGOs or any other groups which can be, let's say, a key, a key stakeholder when starting a discussion on how we can implement innovative projects in a way of bringing closer the research to the public, uh, uh, to the private sector, and in particular with a specific impact to the market. So, uh, apart from focusing on smart specialization in different national programs, in different regional programs, in different programs coming from the Commission, uh, focusing on how the countries and the regions can enhance the blue kind by economy dimension into, into their uh, the projects funded by these programs, we also very, very much focusing on the cooperation on a sea basin and on a macro regional scale. And let me ex exactly explain better what, what we mean. First of all, speaking of a sea basin cooperation, uh, as you probably know, around Europe, there are three sea basins, the Western Med, Western Mediterranean, uh, the Atlantic, and also the Black Sea. So in these three sea basins, the maritime dimension is very, very high in the agenda and with specific topics of potential cooperation and with very good results of cooperation uh, between uh, uh, among the countries and also the regions with very tangible results uh, so far. 
Apart from the sea basins, we have also four macroregions, two of them with a maritime dimension, which is the Baltic Sea uh, macroregional strategy and the European strategy of Adriatic Ionian macroregion. And in particular in the Mediterranean, as there is no a unique sea basin strategy or a unique macroregional strategy, under the framework of the Union for Mediterranean, there is a large uh, group, uh, there is a large ground already very mature for cooperation uh, among the different countries uh, in the Mediterranean, including the European countries and the southern countries as well. And in particular, speaking of blue economy, um, as you probably already know, uh, last year, uh, the ministerial declaration uh, for sustainable blue economy has been adopted by the ministerial countries, by the Mediterranean countries uh, in the framework of the Union for Mediterranean, which has very concrete thematic priorities uh, for the blue economy sectors to be, let's say, as, as, as a ground of cooperation uh, among the countries and with uh, political commitments uh, on behalf of the ministers of the Mediterranean countries to, to, to join the act against this direction. But apart from the, let's say, in a simple way, geographical scope, which is reflected on a sea basin cooperation and on a macro regional cooperation, uh, in the European Commission, and in particular in DG Mare, we are looking also on how we explore synergies for the implementation of the smart specialization strategies for the blue economy sectors. Uh, among different financial frameworks and among uh, different financial uh, tools. And I will start by highlighting the new uh, tool, which is called Interregional Investment Instrument, because this tool, uh, the acronym is I3, is focusing on the interregional cooperation for the implementation of smart specialization strategies. And this, uh, it, it reflects actually this approach of cooperation on a sea basin and on a macro regional scale, and generally, uh, let's say, on a geographical uh, scale and on a pan European level. So, this is very, very relevant to what we are discussing today smart specialization, and also when taking into consideration that, that SDG Mare. We, we, we managed to, uh, um, to, to, to have now highlighted as a, as a thematic priority in this interregional investment instrument, uh, the sustainable blue economy. So there is a large, uh, let's say, room of potential cooperation among you and stakeholders coming from uh, industry or also from public authorities in order you to cooperate together, uh, build consortia and submit a proposal together to this uh, calls of interregional investment instrument, which is actually all, uh, still uh, um, open. Uh, we have the deadline of the next uh, uh, October for submitting proposals. Another instrument very relevant is the Blue Invest, which is focusing on, on the private sector, uh, focusing on, on uh, small and medium enterprises, but also on startups to, let's say, uh, take the advantages of, of be funded for um, um, having uh, uh, interregional uh, entrepreneurial products or for creating business models in the fields of, of Blue Economy. Apart from that, the very well known to everybody, European Maritime Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund uh, provides a large also, let's say, portfolio of, of uh, uh, new uh, uh, projects for the countries to focus on sustainable blue economy, dealing with innovation, dealing also on, on, on new uh, ways of, of uh, uh, let's say, focusing on industries, on research infrastructure, but also with, a, let's say, very dedicated orientation to the market for tangible results as entrepreneurial products coming from the research. And not forget, of course, the, the let's say the most relevant with innovation Horizon Europa uh, program, and in particular, uh, let's say the novelty of the Horizon Europe, which is related to, to a particular mission, as we call it now, for restoring our ocean and waters, which is a mission uh, will be, let's say, in several words, uh, a, a part of the program dedicated to, 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 to projects, to innovative projects uh, related with, uh, with uh, uh, coastal areas and also marine environment for different thematic priorities and with specific, as we call them, lighthouses 
in different um, uh, sea basins, either dealing with the prevention of marine pollution or with the marine renewable energies or with um, uh, innovation in, in, in uh, blue uh, biotechnology um, uh, priorities and potential activities. So uh, what I'm, we're, what I'm trying to, to, to highlight is that uh, uh, speaking of innovation in the concept of the implementation of the smart specialization strategies, it is important to, let's say, mainstream the activities of the research community with the public authority uh, and with the private sector as a, a key way of enabling the smart specialization process to the direct impact to the market as a pathway to go directly to the market with tangible results, either business models or entrepreneurial products also in the blue economy sectors. And blue biotechnology is definitely one of that. So uh, for that reason, uh, what we're doing now in Digimare in cooperation with Digiregion is to set up a new thematic platform on smart specialization and sustainable blue economy in particular, as I said, to promote the innovation and the investments in an interregional partnership and value chains in the way I presented before, focusing on scene basin cooperation or on macro regional cooperation by engaging together the four parts of the quadruple helix, the public, the private, the research and academia, and the citizens and the society in general, and by exploring also synergies, uh, giving the room for synergies uh, among different financial tools, uh, different uh, financial programs uh, provided by the Commission. Um, so what will it will be exactly? Uh, most of you uh, are already uh, very aware of, of the smart specialization process and of the smart specialization thematic platforms. And it was also always uh, also reflected in, in the presentations of previous uh, speakers. Uh, and in particular, EMBRC is, is very, was very uh, keen in the past that it is still very keen to this process. So we are not speaking for something new. Uh, so, so far, uh, there are three existing thematic uh, smart specialization platforms. The one on agri-food, the second one on energy, and the third one on industrial modernization. So what they are going now to do is to, to set up uh, a fourth one on, uh, uh, on blue economy. Uh, these uh, uh, smart specialization platforms are open to any regional or national administration uh, from uh, European or candidate or neighboring countries or to any other non-EU third country uh, or any organization that wish to be involved and to cooperate with other stakeholders in the concept of smart specialization. And these platforms provide, let's say, a room of potential cooperation of creating potential innovative partnerships in order the members of these partnerships, remember members of the quadruple helix, to be, let's say, in a mature way of, of, of cooperation when a, an, a call is open so they can easily uh, uh, prepare a proposal and submit the proposal to an open call. Uh, these thematic platforms are joint initiatives that encourage regions and their innovative actors to, to build these value chains and to, let's say, cooperate in, in particular uh, smart specialization areas which they have identified um, uh, in advance that uh, they are uh, interesting for their stakeholders uh, and for the market in, in, in regional level uh, to, to, to cooperate together. Uh, for doing that and for um, uh, mobilizing the blue economy stakeholders and in particular the regions uh, towards this direction and for bringing together the regions, uh, the, 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 the private sector and the research and academia uh, to this new uh, idea of, of a thematic platform on smart specialization for blue economy, uh, we have uh, organizing, we have started organizing a series of what we call them uh, brokerage events on smart specialization and sustainable economy. Uh, so far, we have organized four, uh, one on uh, blue biotechnology, and the second one on marine renewable energies, the third one on coastal and maritime tourism, and the fourth one on aquaculture, and there is still one to go on fisheries uh, next um, uh, month, on 1st of July, here in Brussels. 
Uh, we are very glad that um, uh, EMBRC uh, uh, was present uh, to, to preliminary discussions uh, together also with uh, HCMR uh, uh, on behalf of Greece, and but also with other stakeholders of, of, of your uh, domains of, of, uh, of um, uh, let's say activities, and also uh, in particular for the first uh, brokerage events uh, that uh, um, IBON has very actively participated and also shared with the participants of, the, of this particular uh, bro uh, brokerage event. Um, let's say the view of the EMBRC, the view of the research, uh, the marine research infrastructures, and let's say potential uh, further aspects on how uh, you uh, see your community sees uh, this, this uh, new approach. Uh, in this uh, particular uh, biotechnology brokerage workshop, it has found that it has highlighted that the blue biotechnology is a very promising uh, sector with a significant innovation potential and um, significant, uh, uh, let's say, potential of cooperation uh, among the different uh, parts of the quadruple helix for, for, for going further to new innovative uh, projects. Uh, the smart specialization initiative, we're glad, uh, very glad to see that uh, it has been, let's say, very well understood by the participants and that there is already uh, a willing and an interest to, to, to upscale both the existing industry on microalgae with the potential of macroalgae as well. And uh, that uh, there are very good ideas, like for example, going for uh, bioproducts or invasive species, or uh, further research on bioplastics or farming waste materials. And uh, speaking of cooperation, and with uh, let's say speaking of uh, how the biotechnology can act in a, in a later stage, uh, not only for the research but also with a specific impact to the market. It has been highlighted that actually it goes hand to hand with aquaculture and that research facilities may contribute to successfully transfer uh, the technical law, uh, knowledge to firms with interest to, to provide also uh, products in, in the algae sector, for example. Uh, but beyond that, it has been highlighted that there is a specific need to, to increase uh, the public uh, capacity of the public uh, authorities. Um, I remember earlier in this session, if I remember well, uh, um, uh, Ibon has also stressed uh, that how you can, uh, let's say, align uh, your your activities with with the uh, with the priorities and the and the willing of the private uh, public sector to cooperate. And uh, it has been also uh, highlighted that it is very important to let's say having the stakeholders on board, actually what we have tried now to do, what we have started to, to do with this low brokerage event, and liaise with the relevant um, actors, the relevant uh, stakeholders, in order to, to explore synergies with other initiatives at regional and regional level. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I don't know if we have time for, for, for some questions because as I mentioned by uh, Ibon uh, earlier, I have to um, um, join another meeting um, later. This is the new normality of uh, jumping from the one meeting to, to another, but please, uh, um, I'm at your disposal if you need some more information or more clarification from my side. So thank you very much. So thank thanks, Eleni. Uh, we are coming a little bit uh, late. I do not know, Adelino, whether we have uh, still some time uh, to allow one questions. One minute. You, you've got one minute. Yeah. OK, so only <laughs> we'll have one minute. I can that's, answer in one minute. That, that's yes. not too much. OK, who is the first one to put the question? It's it's uh, it's actually a, a lot to to digest. I think uh, this particularly this last presentation. Um, yeah. It's but certainly it's back, like maybe you can come maybe back right, to me anytime. Eh? Maybe, maybe the right question is how can we align this platform, Eleni, that you have presented to us, with what Immaculada has shown us at the national level and with what Marco has told us about the industry and their need to link with research infrastructures. So this platform is how it's going to be a meeting place. Uh, how, how, how can we align the three things that we have seen today to finish up? I think the answer to, to, to your question, Ibon, is, uh, let's say, uh, the scope of the creation of this platform to bring together 
all the stakeholders of the Quadruple Helix, which is actually you, the research community, the public sector, the regional authorities and the national authorities, the private sector, either it is industry or startups or small and medium enterprises, and the citizens. This is exactly the scope of this platform, which let's say uh, we hope that it will be operational by the end of, of, the, of, the, of the year. So I think what we are doing now, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to, 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 to be present in your conference today, what we did with the brokerage events and one we will do with further events or other opportunities to bring together these parts of the Quadruple Helix is the way of aligning our activities. Let's say for trying not to speak the same language because we don't speak, uh, research is, is speaking another language, uh, 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 private sector another one, but, but let's say to find common pathways <laughs> of cooperation and for aligning let's say, the, the way we see the impact of the research activity to the market. Thanks, Eleni. Do we have time for one more question, Adelino? Of course. For yes, anybody? you can ask one more question. So I, I saw Ilaria wanted to ask something. Well, that was a really a small question about uh, whether this alignment could be facilitated by some seed funding. Because what we've seen in Enrich, uh, I'm part of the Enrich project uh, with Marco, and uh, what we have seen is one of the entry barriers to industry research collaboration or any sort of particle helix collaboration is actually providing a small incentive that could leverage synergies. And we've, we have examples, for example, in Ireland, in Sweden, of programs at the national level that would facilitate this kind of exchanges. And they can be tiered in the sense that you can have a very small grant, something like a few thousand euro, 5,000 euro to start the conversation and see if there is something, you know, in fact, to, to talk about and, and, and start maybe some exchanges. Mm -hmm. And then you could go to another level, you can get some tens of thousands, maybe 30, 50,000 to start the feasibility study and then a commercialization grant that goes up to hundreds of thousands to go to the next step. So this could be a tiered, an evolution of a process and mm -hmm. you start from a one meeting and you go to commercialization or it could be that you're at a certain stage and a certain scheme applies to you. This would be very beneficial in my opinion to have it built into various research uh, grants into various calls. Do you think this is something that is possible? Well, what I can say, well, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, intervention. It's uh, actually very, very important what you're mentioning and fully agree. Uh, well, I, what I can share with you is that uh, uh, through this platform, thematic platform, we are also foreseeing, let's say, uh, an assistance uh, to, 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 to mostly to the regions, but also generally to, 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 to the, uh, let's say, uh, stakeholders which will be involved in order to provide some, you know, trainings in order to, to, to try to increase their capacity, to increase their, let's say, interest and awareness of cooperation. So let's say that we believe that that can be an entry point. And of course, let's say the, 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 mo the most, uh, let's say, strong, um, uh, let's say, way of, of uh, let's say, um, uh, tricking their appetite is different financial programs, which all of them uh, have inside the concept of the smart specialization, which means that in order to, 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 to have a very good promising proposal is that you can uh, be able to engage these four parts of the quadrant of helix together. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for participating. And uh, thank you, very thank much. you all. Thank I take the opportunity to, to thank everybody for thank participating. Thank you very much. Here. And, uh, as mentioned before, as DG Mario, we are uh, very, let's say, uh, at your disposal, open for any other possibilities. We can come and intervene and exchange with your community. Thank you very much for, for having us uh, at your conference. Thank you very much. We need to come to an end. Sadelino is throwing us out. Uh, sorry, I always organize things very convoluted, uh, so I didn't give. Any, I I have not given you chance to any conversation afterwards. That's my problem. Uh, <laughs> but I hope uh, you have learned uh, a lot today, and uh, you know where we are. If we need any uh, any feedback following the the workshop, so uh, thanks a lot for your participation.
uh, I hope you brought something positive home. Thank you very Thank you. much, Yvonne. Thank you, uh, and also Ilarian for uh, organizing this and also the participants. So we have now to move to the next session, which is uh, basically a series of invited lectures. And uh, the first one is by João Neiva, he is uh, a researcher of the CSMR, and he's going to talk about DNA barcoding of Atlantic Cistuzera sensulato supports taxonomic rearrangements and reveals novel biogeographic insights. So please, João, can you uh, start? I haven't checked if you are there. I hope you are. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Can you can you hear me well? Perfect. Well, uh, the hearing maybe should get a bit nearer. Uh, can you hear me now? That's fine. That's fine. Okay, and you can uh, see the screen. That's fine as well. We can see perf perfectly fine. So just uh, before you start, I uh, I will have to leave, but my colleague Patricia will then continue moderating. Very well. Very well. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks. Uh, for the organization for this invitation to present my work here. Uh, so my work uh, is uh, on DNA barcoding of Cistuzera sensulato, supports taxonomic rearrangements and reveals novel biogeographical insights. So most of my work at CCMAR uh, concerns uh, Northeast Atlantic marine forests. We are more or less aware of these marine forests, especially when it comes to kelps and intertidal fucalians. But uh, most of us maybe don't know that the uh, group that harbors most diversity when it comes to species uh, in these marine forests is uh, the group of Cistuzera, which uh, has uh, over 75 uh, morphotaxa currently uh, recognized. And that exceeds uh, by, by far the, the number of kelps or, or, or other groups. So <clears throat> this, this uh, group of Cistuzera have enormous ecological, biogeographical and conservation significance, like uh, seagrass meadows and kelp forests, they provide uh, food, shelter, nursing grounds to a range of associated species. But perhaps more significant, this entire radiation is endemic to the Northeast Atlantic and the Mediterranean. That means that all these species, all this radiation uh, evolves and uh, is unique to this, to this area. And um, despite its uh, ecological importance and significance, there, there has uh, been a, a lot of regional declines um, uh, documented from the Canary Islands to the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. <clears throat> and uh, even considering this uh, ecological importance and biogeogra biogeographical significance and uh, ongoing declines, the taxonomy of the group itself is still very fuzzy when compared to other important uh, macrophyte groups like seagrasses and, and uh, kelps. So the problem is that they are very easy to recognize uh, on the shore, but they are much harder to classify uh, at the species level, uh, even by trained uh, phycologists. So <clears throat> one of the reasons that this happens, it's because they, like so many other uh, macroalgal groups, have a lot of morphological plasticity and also most species can be confounded by uh, related and not so related uh, uh, species. And uh, many species have uh, only hold and very synthetic descriptions. And in general, there is a lack of taxonomical expertise. Many uh, few people can recognize and dominate this group so that most of the biogeographical information is uh, imperfect uh, to say the least. And many regions anyway, continue to be very poorly surveyed. So, of course, this has uh, consequences. For instance, this shifts um, uh, focus to higher taxonomical ranks. For instance, in the Barcelona Convention that lists all the species that should be protected, uh, all, all species of macrophytes are uh, individually listed, but Cistuzero is listed as a group. And of course, systematic misidentification leads to poor baseline data and confounds patterns of diversity, our assessments of endemism, and can, of course, mask community shifts 
in general and globally, all these uh, taxonomical problems compromise monitoring and conservation efforts. Of course, the way forward would be to add some uh, molecular angle to this uh, conversation. And this has been uh, called from uh, as early as 2007. And there is a seminal work by Dreisma in 2010, where the first phylogenetic approach to Cistuzero diversity already demonstrated that Cistuzero was not composed by uh, one genus, but three different unrelated evolutionary lineages that are currently named as Cistuzero sensu stricti, Ericaria, and Gongularia. So <clears throat> several other uh, studies have uh, followed similar phylogenetic approaches to Cistuzero diversity. <clears throat> uh, in general, each study used its own set of markers, and in general, they all have uh, exhibit quite uh, insufficient resolution, uh, particularly within species complexes. So <clears throat> uh, in addition to this, they have also focused on uh, specific taxonomical groups or uh, specific geographical uh, areas. So <clears throat> there is no single study encompassing the generality of the group. And because of the different markers and species types used in each study, these studies are very different, difficult to integrate in a broader uh, study. So for all these regions, uh, reasons, boundaries and geographical ranges for most species remain imprecise. <clears throat> and the validity of uh, several texts uh, still requires uh, verification. So where do we want to uh, uh, move from here? So we suggested that uh, we could use a simple barcoding phylogeographic approach uh, based on uh, a longer uh, barcoding marker. And most of all, to uh, focus on increasing taxonomical and geographical replication. So to cover all the species and all regions at the same time. And this would allow us to uh, move much further than the previous studies. So the main objectives of this study were to delimit and map major genetic entities uh, and to provide a replicated Bauschebeck reference database of barcodes for this group for future reference and to gain new insights regarding the taxonomy, diversity, evolution, and biogeography of cis So this involved a lot of field campaigns, some uh, in the context actually of assembled tools, uh, opportunistic sampling and uh, collaborations abroad. So we tried to gather as much samples from as many morphotaxa possible, from as many regions uh, possible as well. We obtain outgroups for phylogenetic analysis, and we sequence all, all sequence all individuals for uh, 1.2 KB uh, COX-1 fragment, and we added a few sequences available already from GeneBank. Of course, all the material uh, used in the study was also kept uh, as herbarium vouchers for uh, future reference as well. So we. Uh, the species delimitation methods to avoid uh, subjective uh, delimitations in face of our uh, incomplete knowledge. We use several algorithms. We uh, looked at if we could use a barcoding gap to uh, define species, uh, which in theory would uh, make, make a, sing a single threshold uh, useful just to, to decide what the species was within this group. We did uh, phylogeographic analysis. We map all the haplotypic variation, and we use one or two representatives of each multi U uh, recovered, and we sequence for additional markers uh, to obtain longer concatenated data sets to um, do phylogenetic uh, Bayesian and maximum likelihood phylogenetic analysis. So globally, uh, we uh, obtain over 290. COX-1 barcodes covering uh, more than 35 morphotaxa from the entire range of the group, from Cape Verde to the British Isles and from Azores to Israel and the Black Sea. 
and uh, species delimitation methods recover uh, very different uh, sets of species uh, depending on, on the method of, uh, that was being used. At the left, JMOTU produced the, most num the, the highest number of MOTUs, and this is, was actually the one that matched more closely uh, the a priori delimitation of uh, most species uh, morphologically wise. And uh, the, the, uh, the remaining methods uh, tended to lump many of these uh, genetic entities into uh, bigger entities. So for uh, subsequent analysis, we kept the sets of MOTUs that were obtained with JMOTU because most of these uh, uh, MOTUs are actually recognized by the generality of the pharmacological community and many have uh, speci uh, special specific biogeographical ranges. So we kept this uh, uh, set of multi-use at the left. So looking at cis 2 zeta census strict, we detected uh, two uh, lineages, one composed by cis 2 zeta phoeniculacea with an Atlantic and Mediterranean distribution, and another lineage composed of three uh, species, two of them that were already recognized, but a third one that we resurrect as Cistozera pustulata was, uh, not, was, not, was not recognized at species level, but we demonstrate that is a, a separate species with a Mediterranean and Macaronesian distribution. Ericaria <clears throat> was uh, basically a Mediterranean uh, genus uh, with five lineages. Three of them were uh, monospecific, only had one species, but two of them uh, showed a lot of diversity. Uh, one of them, the Ericaria selaginage complex, was composed by three haplogroups that uh, did not match um, morphotaxa, uh, three morphotaxa that were only re also recognized within this, this group, but they showed a lot of other geographical uh, structuration. So lineage A was present in the Atlantic and the Western Mediterranean, lineage B in Catalonia and Sicily, and lineage C in Central and Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, when we look at the, the fifth lineage, Ericaria crinita sensuato grouped at least three morphotaxa, Ericaria crinita, Ericaria barbatula, and Ericaria jaconei. And conversely, Ericaria brachycarpa was composed of two very divergent lineages, one that we retain as Ericaria brachycarpa sensu stricto, and one that we retain as, we resurrect as Ericaria bolicaria, boliarica combination, another, a new combination. And they have the joint distributions in the Mediterranean. So Gongolaria was composed as, with was composed by two very divergent clades. One of them composed by two single uh, multi-use, uh, distribute with, with the joint distribution in temperate and um, tropical uh, Macaronesian archipelagos. One of them have was transferred to Gongolaria as Gongolaria sandari. And the other lineage <coughs> was composed as Gongolaria bacata and Gongolaria urniois. These are two large Atlantic species. And Gongolaria barbata that we demonstrate is endemic to the Mediterranean. And the uh, final, the third lineage within Gongolaria B was composed of many, many uh, uh, very closely related entities with uh, very uh, strong spatial structuration. For instance, <coughs> Mongolia species one, this is a species that we recognize as a separate species, was present in Macaronesia. Gongolaria uh, nodicaldis in the Atlantic, Gongolaria gibraltarica in the Atlantic Mediterranean transition, Gongolaria montagne and elegans in the Western Mediterranean, and uh, another species, Gongolaria sp2, different from the Western entities that was present in Central and Eastern Mediterranean. So <clears throat> this approach uh, really allows us, allowed us to move a bit further on the taxonomy and uh, biogeography of cis So we were able to obtain much higher resolution and number of diagnostic mutations. Phylogeographical signal proved to overcome and be very useful uh, to overcome the low phylogenetic signal uh, that most of these species exhibit. 
And because we did such a, a widespread uh, sampling, we uh, had much more power to detect cryptic species or to uh, recognize oversplitting in some cases. And uh, we reduced the problems associated with single species types. So <clears throat> in the end, and this is one of the interesting results from the studies that most species had to be reclassified or redefined, whereas we also had to reinstate or recognize additional entities. So in the uh, multi uh, panel on the left that we show, in, the, in blue, we have species that were retained as they were before, but they were transferred to new genes, Ericare and Gungularia, and all the ones that are in yellow had to be uh, resurrected or uh, described de novo or synonymized with entities that were already available, or they will have to be redefined or they remain unresolved. So in the end, the, the, the few species that are left in white are the ones that we uh, did not uh, alter any in any way the, the taxonomy. So this simple study based on very uh, straightforward uh, approach and uh, actually quite cheap uh, already allows us to move much further in this uh, uh, attempt to, to, to uh, define the, the, the diversity within Sistizan. So just for the uh, Algarve audience, uh, if there is some, um, in Rio Formosa, for instance, this approach allows us to uh, detect, uh, we had a, a species that was uh, identified as Gongularia barbata in, in tradi traditional textbooks. But uh, it turned out that uh, it's not only one species, it's two. And uh, in both cases, it's a different species than the one that was originally described. So this approach allows us very quickly to detect phylogenetic conflict, uh, sorry, taxonomic con conflict, and to um, um, compare available sequences with a broader data set. Uh, so, uh, going back to the barcode gap, we show that uh, there is a, a, a marginally overlap between interspecific and inter interspecific differences, uh, divergence uh, in multi use. So, this precludes the use of sim simple thresholds to delimit uh, species. It's, in most cases, you, you actually can, but there is, a, as we can see in this graph in the center, there is a gray area where uh, certain divergence can correspond to either uh, intraspecific differences or interspecific differences. Uh, the phylogenetic analysis that we did based on the, an extended panel of markers, uh, in the end did not uh, brought, bring uh, much more phylogenetic uh, insights than with the COX-1 alone. So basically the uh, uh, the, lin the, the divergent lineages, the relationship between divergent lineages and within uh, species within shallow complexes remain poorly supported. And this su suggests that COX-1 alone can provide already a, a, a good first proxy to reconstruct phylogenetic uh, affinities within uh, C2Z. And then adding more markers may only add a very marginal resolution. Perhaps what is more interesting is to realize that some lineages are very species poor, uh, meaning that these lineages in particular are uh, very uh, important to conserve from a phylogenetic point of view because they, if they're gone, uh, the entire lineage is no longer represented in extant biodiversity. So just to summarize, uh, C2Z census strict was, uh, we detected four species with widespread distributions and a, a hotspot uh, in Macaronesia. Ericaria, we, we clearly demonstrate that is a Mediterranean genus with only one multi U found in the Atlantic. And uh, several species are widespread, but we also have a few endemics. And Gongularia, most species are either Atlantic or Macaronesian or Mediterranean. And even in the Mediterranean, they are either present in the Eastern or Western Mediterranean. So they tend to be much more spatially uh, disjunct. Uh, uh, there's a widespread and narrow species, but they tend to occupy specific ranges within the general area. So where do we go from here? First, we need to translate all these multi-use into 
uh, keys that ecologists can use in the field, but this is beyond the scope of this study. What we can also do is to screen more regions for the same standardized barcode. I'm thinking that several regions, uh, marked here in red and right, have been very poorly surveyed genetically, so we could uh, still uh, try to validate and uh, investigate the affinities, affinities of many unsampled taxa and potentially even new cryptic taxa. And we could refine emerging biogeographical patterns. For instance, in these examples uh, in the left, we show that there are uh, contact zones between Eastern and Western entities that are very closely related, but they are associated with Western Mediterranean Basin or Eastern Mediterranean Basin. And it would be very interesting to refine where these secondary contacts exist and if they are shared between species or if they are kind of idiosyncratic. But available data suggests to me that there is an area that uh, probably corresponds to a contact zone of multiple species. And of course, <clears throat> move a bit uh, uh, from this uh, traditional uh, single marker approach to more uh, potent analysis uh, that are also more expensive and more demanding bioinformatically. But now that the multi-use are much better defined, uh, it would be much easier to invest in such kind of analysis. And this would not only allow us to validate species boundaries that were defined based on a single marker, but we could also explore hybridization. And more importantly, we could reconstruct, we detail the diversification of its genes. In another example that is emerging from this data, we have a lot of sister species with this dejoint Atlantic versus Mediterranean species. That would be very good models to investigate this uh, in and out uh, migrations and speciations in and out of the Mediterranean. So we have Atlantic and Mediterranean sister taxa, which suggests that there is these dynamics in and out of the Mediterranean. So I will just finish by acknowledging my funding sources, uh, mostly uh, FCT, but also Assemble. And of course, the many people that contributed with sampling or helped sampling or were involved in any way in the development of this study. Many of them are, uh, of course, co-authors in a paper that was submitted and is under revision, and hopefully it, it will be uh, available for the broader audience and uh, scientific community in the near future. So many thanks for your attention, and I'm, of course, available for questions. Thank you very much, Joan. So vast conclusions and a nice overview. Uh, and we are open for one quick question from the audience, if somebody has something. In the, the meanwhile, I ask uh, Olian and the next speaker to start sharing the, the screen also. No questions? I have one uh, like um, general question in terms of communication. When you, you have, when we discover all these new species and so on, how do communicate, this is communicators as scientific papers, of course. <laughs> but then to the more general people or databases or whatever, what is the, the path usually? This, this, these kinds of studies, you have several sources that are available for the, 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 the general scientific community. First, the sequences are of course available. Uh, material that corresponds to these uh, new entities are also deposited in herbaria. And uh, there are short descriptions that we make available uh, either in the larger paper or separate notes for more maybe taxonomically oriented mm -hmm. uh, journals. But this is a, a process that can be tracked uh, from morphology to, 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 to the field. Mm -hmm. The problem is always that there is a lot of uh, plasticity and a lot of uh, lack of taxonomical expertise. So <clears throat> for the general uh, person, even for trained psychologists, is uh, sometimes mm -hmm. difficult in the field to be uh, certain of the, the species that we are of doing. Course. And this is why this, is a pro this approach may be useful, for instance, for people that are engaged in projects that are not particularly evolutionary oriented, but they are uh, they have a conservation component and you want to be sure which species you are uh, for instance restoring uh, and and these these kinds of approaches 
will allow you very easily to, to make sure that you're not uh, overlooking. More accurate and so on, of course. Thank you so much, Joao. And now we have Eliana sharing. Hello, Eliana. Nice to see you again. So first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present the results obtained uh, uh, from the project titled Transcriptom for the Eat Organs on Small Fish, a new insight into the evolution of a molecular mechanism that uh, uh, was uh, uh, founded by uh, Assemble Plus, and uh, it was carried out uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Philippe Castro for CCMAR uh, and FCUP uh, of uh, Porto. Uh, he is an expert in big data analysis, specifically in transcriptomic and genomics, uh, and also uh, the uh, PhD student in my lab was uh, uh, deeply involved in this project uh, the, and the results were part of his uh, doctorate thesis um, entitled uh, as well fish reproduction and sustainable fishery um, management. So the objective... Can I interrupt you, Aliena? In the meanwhile, we don't have the sharing of your screen while we are changing the sound. You must share again, please. Before it was sharing well, yes, it was just taking time. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So the objective of this study uh, uh, were to expand the molecular toolbox available for the overfished Mediterranean swallow fish and gain deeper insight into the molecular network responsible for the heat production uh, in the highly specialized uh, eater tissue through a de novo transcriptome assembly approach. Uh, the adaptation of, of uh, species to a specific ecological niche comprehends the evolution of a specific trait and the endogenous control of body temperature is an example of such trait and represents a major evolutionary transit in the history of vertebrates. Uh, birds and mammals, for example, are able to defend their body temperature within the thermoneutral zone by basal metabolism using different anatomical solution and physiological process. So uh, endothermy has probably evolved uh, several times in the amniotes and also in other non-amniote lineages, displaying uh, variable forms of uh, endothermy like in fish, uh, where we can see two different thermoregulation um, mechanism, one represented by non-shevering thermogenesis uh, in blue and others uh, thermogenesis mechanism uh, that uh, are reported in green. Um, uh, so, sorry, Eliana, I'm sorry. I think we still don't see it in presentation mode. So we, are, we were still in the slide of the objectives. So now I know that when you- I don't it. know how. Yeah, so just uh, in the bottom to the presentation modes, it was fine. Sorry. We could see in the miniature of the next slide and I was uh, understanding if it was already. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what is wrong. So what, share the screen. Let's just try again, yes. No, no problem, we have time. Schermo intero, okay. Full screen. Mm -hmm. It's taking a, a slip. A little bit of time, probably to appear after a few. But it seems it is not, not working. I don't not know. shared yet. Can you see? Uh, not yet, but before we could. No yet. Not yet. Ah, 
I'm sharing the, the mm -hmm. screen. Let me try out something. Can you try again now? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's sharing. And now just put in presentation mode. Can you see now? Now, yes. And just uh, try to pass the slide. Let's try to, be sure. yes. to the next. It yes. is OK? It is changing. Perfect. Okay. So now we have every, everything. I'm sorry. Everything okay. working now. No problem. OK. Um, so um, the our um, target species is wallfish and is uh, a large pelagic uh, uh, fish. And recently, the uh, Mediterranean stock has been classified as uh, overfished by the ICAT, the International Commission for Conservation of Atlantic Tuna. And uh, over the upcoming years, a recovery plan uh, it is running to limit the catches. So the small fish is a fantastic predator and faster swimmer uh, on the earth, probably, and uh, uh, is dealing with uh, a very impressive thermocline from 5 to 26 uh, degrees centigrade. And this is possible because uh, developed a specific endothermy. Uh, um, so, um, the question is how the eat or tissue evolved to produce it. In Atelios, the endothermy is unusual and only uh, be documented uh, in uh, scombroid, uh, including uh, tuna and swordfish. Uh, however, the modality in these species are different. Uh, tuna uh, maintain elevate body temperature by conserving the heat generated in slow oxidative swimming musculature. Small fish has regional endothermy in bray and high by heat uh, generating organ derived from modified skeletal muscle. Uh, in the small fish, the eater gland here in red, generated from the modification of the superior rectus muscle, allow the warming of the heat and ice respect to the surrounding water. And a delta of a temperature can be uh, found between cranium temperature and water. Uh, the sampling of uh, each gland was done uh, uh, from freshly uh, caught uh, swordfish on board of long liners. And the dark part of the eater was used for the transcriptomic uh, uh, analysis. Um, um, Cells from uh, the uh, eater gland shows uh, uh, a cytoplasm mostly packed with mitochondria and uh, uh, with a very uh, uh, high uh, presence of a sarcoplasmic reticulum here evidenced by the arrow. Um, and uh, the, the scheme here represents the different part of the uh, gland with the uh, transition zone from regular muscle fiber to either cell and transition zone from either cell and parenchyma plus counter current system uh, essential for the maintenance of the warm temperature. The histological analysis of the eater tissue uh, evidenced a very high heterogeneity. Here we can see the uh, counter current exchange with veins and arteries, 
uh, in B, uh, we can see the ether tissue uh, in the um, con con connected with the um, boundless, uh, vascular boundless, uh, and almost the absence of a connective tissue that is represented in blue here. In C, we can see the um, abundant uh, poorly vascularized fat that might be useful for uh, thermal capacity and to buffer the heat loss. In DNA, uh, we can see uh, the uh, ether cells surrounded by a vascular um, boundless, completely lacking of a sarcomeric organization. F is the ether cells. G is the transition uh, region between muscle and ether cells. In H, we can see the melanomacrophagy, typical of uh, hemolymphopoietic emo, emo, uh, organs. Uh, in this case, they are present just close to the uh, blood vesicles. And uh, um, probably uh, due to the nature of the tissue uh, with a, a very uh, high temperature production and very um, mitochondrial uh, high activity. So we hypothesize that uh, a lot of reactive oxygen species can be produced. And so uh, the elimination of cell or uh, uh, some uh, uh, organelles uh, by these uh, melanomacrophages can occur. Uh, the characterization of the ether gland was important and necessary to select the uh, ether part of the gland for the transcriptomic analysis. The uh, workflow uh, show the step required for sampling, sequencing, and raw data uh, cleaning, filtering, the de novo assembling, and the uh, annotation. Uh, for time reason, I don't go through it. Uh, however, all the uh, mm, software used are indicated uh, in, in the bracket. Um, in the final assembly of the transcriptome, we got more than uh, 28,000 uh, transcripts, consisting of at least an open reading frame of 100 amino acids. Uh, the uh, quality was good and 50 was uh, uh, more than 3,000 transcripts and 19, 1,000. And the uh, back mapping is very good with an over 90% and 78% uh, in the uh, final uh, assembly. So the data have been deposited in the marine data uh, archive, and here is the link to see the results obtained. Uh, the, um, sorry, the uh, top uh, 10 uh, gene ontology terms evidenced three major uh, categories, cellular component, molecular function, and biological process. And uh, uh, regarding the cellular components, uh, we can see uh, cytoplasm nucleo and uh, cytosol terms uh, together with the uh, uh, integral component of a membrane uh, that are the uh, most uh, mapping uh, uh, class uh, together with the mitochondria and uh, um, typical of the ether tissue and sarcoplasmic uh, reticulum with a, a massive presence of uh, calcium ATPase, characteristic of the uh, highlight the uh, exceptional oxidative capacity of this tissue, uh, the eating ability and the uh, calcium cycling 
the molecular function um, is uh, um, um, very well uh, uh, represented as well. And the uh, metal ion and ATP binding, DNA, bi DNA binding and calcium ion binding are the more representative map in transcript. And uh, further confirming the idea that ATP uh, full led calcium cycling is one of the most prominent process driving the physiology of the eater cells. Finally, the biological press, uh, process, uh, we can see um, uh, positive and negative regulator of transcriptor by RNA polymerase as the major mapping process. And uh, um, uh, which along with the, um, some molecular functions such as binding of DNA, binding, binding transcript, um, uh, would uh, suggest an intense transcriptional activity of this tissue. Uh, an interesting question, how the molecular network was uh, uh, rewired in a specialized tissue to produce it uh, uh, in different lineages? To answer this question, we try uh, two different approaches, uh, the comparative approach and the functional one. Regarding the comparative approach, brown adipose tissue, uh, non shavering, uh, typical of mouse, uh, the deep red muscle having sharing uh, thermogenesis, typical of tuna, and uh, the eater uh, tissue, non shavering thermogenesis, typical of swordfish, were compared. And the um, uh, enrichment, uh, geo enrichment analysis of the top 200 most expressed genes were performed. And in the mouse, uh, um, the uh, main findings were beta oxidation of fatty acids, uh, oxidative phosphorylation, lipid metabolism, and the main four was. Uh, found to be lipids and in lesser amount uh, sugar. Uh, regarding tuna, uh, the main findings are uh, muscle contra contraction, energy production by glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation, and pyruvate transport uh, into mitochondria, and the main fuel is uh, sugar. No uh, rich terms related to beta oxidation of fatty acids were found. Uh, regarding uh, swallowfish, the main finding is muscle contraction, energy production, and again, the full was sugar and no enrichment in terms of uh, beta oxidation as in tuna fish. So here are reported all the uh, biological process common to the different species. And uh, interestingly, uh, the um, uh, common to tuna and swallowfish, fish, uh, we found the phosphocreatine biosynthetic process. The phosphocreatine is uh, generally present in uh, high concentration in uh, striated muscle, uh, where it is synthesized in, uh, and broken down by creatine uh, phosphokinase to buffer the ATP concentration. So it acts as a, an immediate energy reserve for the muscle. While in tuna we have a contractile uh, muscle, no fiber muscle, are present in small fish. So uh, what can be the meaning uh, of this uh, under the functional point of view of the presence of this uh, um, uh, pathway? The phosphocreatine um, as a function of shuttle uh, linking the ATP production uh, synthesis, so, and the ATP consumption uh, that in tuna uh, is used for contraction. Uh, in small fish, 
uh, we do not have a contraction, as I mentioned, and the creatine kinase is present in the heat gland and produce ATP. But uh, in this case, we have uh, uh, another interesting molecule, CERCA, calcium pumping, uh, controlling the uh, futile cycle of calcium. And uh, this uh, uh, protein is uh, responsible for the eater production in uh, small fish. Um, Eater cell uh, presents uh, uh, extensive sarcoplasmia reticula uh, when uh, analyzed in electron microscopy, whereas calcium is stored. And the transverse tubule present in the uh, um, gland uh, are associated with the voltage sensor able to activate the uh, renodine receptor on the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, and this uh, uh, is responsible for the calcium release that can be compartmentalized in the, to the mitochondria and then start the production of ATP. Uh, so, um, uh, CERCA as mentioned before, is responsible uh, for the futile calcium cycle uh, and consume ATP uh, to produce it. And it was uh, suggested by a previous study of Barbara Block, and then actually uh, um, in 2021, Buetal uh, Mm, annotated the uh, genome of small fish, Pacific small fish, and uh, also evidenced another important uh, uh, gene in addition to CERCA and uh, um, the uh, system uh, related with the eat, all the system related with the eating, and it was the uh, pyruvate kinase that is. Uh, uh, important for the uh, glycolysis as uh, uh, evidenced in this uh, uh, schema. And um, uh, so um, the study evidenced uh, a convergent evolution of key genes of calcium cycling system between tuna and swordfish and uh, the three genes that were uh, uh, analyzed were pyruvate kinase, CERCA, and uh, rhianodine receptor 1, uh, all involved in the calcium cycling system. Uh, despite all the difference regarding endothermal regulation between tuna and swordfish, so uh, our study uh, and uh, were supported uh, uh, from the more recent publication uh, from uh, the uh, genome assembly, uh, evidenced a convergent uh, evolution of the main genes uh, involved in thermoregulation. Uh, so it will be nice to uh, continue this uh, uh, study, uh, testing the, uh, for the positive selection for the cascade of uh, glycolysis-related genes, uh, um, especially mitochondrial pyruvate carriers like um, PC1 and 2, and see if uh, we can demonstrate a correlation uh, uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, the, the, all the process described, but uh, also uh, make a, a comparative study, not just with tuna, but with other uh, species that, uh, fish species that uh, present endothermy like offers. Um, so I, I wish to uh, conclude my uh, presentation acknowledging uh, the founder of this proposal. It was a great experience to share the uh, expertise of our lab with the lab of uh, uh, Professor Philippe Castro. And uh, uh, we are uh, um, finalizing the, uh, the last 
part uh, of the study to publish it as soon as possible. And uh, uh, here is the uh, younger part of the uh, team at uh, uh, Ancona University. And I thank all of you for the attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aliana. Such an in interesting topic. This specialized tissue and also a uh, nice species. Yeah, it was very challenging and new also for us. But everything, I, everything new, exactly. Yeah, uh, I, I ask the like audience it. if there is any question. I don't see any end or nothing in the chat. So I know that now everything is new. Oh, I, there is one. Miguel Pina, do you want to ask or I can ask? Okay. I wonder uh, if it is possible to do any gene knockout experiment. I don't think so, uh, Miguel, because uh, uh, swordfish is not a lab um, species, so uh, making knockout, uh, I think, is very difficult, especially because uh, we have no the ability to reproduce in captivity this species. Uh, so um, what we can do is just try to make some changes at gene level and see uh, in vitro if the activity of the SAC gene can be uh, modified. Oh, and okay. We had a slight cut, but now we can hear you. We heard most of it. So did you, did you hear my answer or not? It, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> no, but uh, there, there are other approach that might be can help to um, establish uh, if there is a convergent evolution uh, between species with uh, uh, quite different st right. endotherm strategies. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And we still had one minute. Uh, I also ask Stefan to start sharing the screen. And Oliana, when this is still uh, early because you are still trying to see the functions and the players and so on. And then yeah, I wonder yeah. what, what will be, probably there is any news yet, uh, the impact of the pollutants or warming, for instance. Yeah, but yeah, that another question, and also uh, how occur the um, trans the differentiation from muscle to eater uh, cells. So that's another very um, challenge. Yeah, Many doors opening. Exactly. So we to to. Um, uh, do some experiment to, to have some answer about this. Okay, exactly. thank you. Thank you so much. We will have uh, Stéphane Roberti from University of Liège, Belgium, talking about the comparison of the photosynthetic electron transport in shallow and mesophotic colonies of reef building coral. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Stefan Roberti. Uh, I'm a photophysiologist and I'm currently based at the University of Liège. And today I'm going to talk to you about a study we did um, in ALAT thanks to the Ascend Plus program. Uh, so let's go. Up. Does it work? Yes, perfect. As you know, um, because of the symbiotic relationship existing between scleractinians and their photosynthetic in the symbionts, reef building corals are highly dependent on the intensity and the quality of light for their growth. Some coral species have been found to inhabit uh, shallow and mesophotic parts of the reef. Uh, and those species uh, display important changes uh, related to photoacclimation and photoadaptation as light uh, wavelengths decrease from red to blue light, so does the ability of light to uh, penetrate the water, as you can see here on this diagram. 
those photo acclimation or photo adaptation strategies can be related to uh, the uh, different parameter. One of them is the morphology of the coral colony. For instance, here you have an example between shallow versus uh, deep colonies. We have also change in the symbionts abundance, but also in the composition of the symbionts community. So the change in the different genetics, uh, different species of symbionts. You have also change in food regime, where, for instance, uh, deeper corals can rely more on heterotrophic compared to uh, shallow uh, colonies. You have also change in pigments, pigment algae, but also host pigments. And you have also uh, the photosynthetic activity, uh, with which is uh, different between mesophytic colonies. And this is on this last point that I'm going to focus for the rest of this presentation. So as you also know, light intensity is changing continuously uh, from seconds to hours and even to months. And therefore, photosynthetic organisms must adapt to these changes and, have, uh, and they have developed different strategies to acclimate at different time scale. So here is uh, some examples from uh, plants, but it, uh, it, it's also the same from, uh, for algae or uh, marine plants. So uh, at very short time scale, the plants can modify uh, the electron flows in the photosynthetic apparatus. But short-term acclimation processes also include regulation of the activity of some enzyme, as well as uh, protein uh, degradation. On longer time scales, changes in gene expression and net protein synthesis, synthesis uh, can be induced, which contribute to the, to the overall acclimation of the plants to both biotic or abiotic uh, stimuli. Eventually, at a uh, longer time scale, adaptation processes uh, develop and they involve genetic change leading to uh, irreversible acclimation to specific environments and thus opening the way to uh, speciation processes. So in, in corals, um, most of our knowledge about the photoacclimation processes with depths uh, is related to long-term acclimation strategies. And we know little about the short-term acclimation strategies occurring in the photosynthetic apparatus of the coral in the, in the symbionts. Most of them uh, should be related to non-photochemical quenching, but also to alternative electron flows that has been found to play a significant role uh, in photoprotection. So uh, our research question was, do the nature and the extent of the photosynthetic alternative electron flow uh, differ with depth? So first of all, uh, let me do a brief introduction to alternative uh, electron flow in the photosynthetic apparatus for, the, for those that are not familiar with uh, that concept. So here is uh, a scheme illustrating the photosynthetic apparatus. And uh, so uh, during photosynthesis, there is uh, a linear uh, electron flow in which electrons coming from water are translocated through different protein complexes. So PS1, PS2, cytochrome B6F. The, uh, different electron carriers, like the plastokinone and the cytochrome uh, C6. And this linear electron flow will, at the end, reduce NADP plus here into NADPH. And this NADPH will fuel the, chival, the Calvin cycles and the mitochondrial respiration inside the cells. But in addition to this linear electron flow, there is also alternative electron flow. Uh, the first one is cyclic electron flow, this one, in which electrons at the PS1 acceptor side are injected back uh, at the donor side of PS1 through the involvement of protein complexes like NDH or PHGRL1. 
And you have also chlorespiration, which is uh, located here, in which uh, this process will reduce oxygen involving uh, plastokinone pool and uh, a plastidial terminase oxidase called PTOX. Finally, you have also uh, um, a pathway which is called the Muller reaction, in which oxygen is directly reduced by electron uh, coming from PS1 uh, and likely by ferredoxine. So a couple of years uh, ago, we uh, developed uh, advanced biophysical and spectroscopic methods uh, on small coral fragments in the lab. Uh, to be able to measure uh, this kind of phenomenon uh, directly on coral fragments. So uh, thanks to these developments, uh, we were able to, to conduct uh, this kind of experiment in the field. So we uh, packed uh, all of our stuff and uh, joined the marine station, so the IU1, uh, thanks to the uh, Assemble Plus program. So it was in November 2019, so a long time ago now. And um, during this field trip, in fact, we uh, decided to compare uh, colonies of uh, stylophorus pistillata, so uh, reef building corals, uh, which is uh, quite abundant in that area. And so we decided to compare colonies uh, collected at 10 meters uh, compared to uh, colonies collected in the upper mesophotic uh, part of the reef, so at 40 meters. After, so on these colonies, we analyze uh, different uh, parameters related to the photosynthetic activity, like PS1 and PS2 activities, oxygen exchange also, and the re re reduction rates of a uh, photosystem one. And we also analyze other parameters like pigment profiles and the symbionts density and uh, we also uh, characterize the composition of the, the, the symbiotic, the under symbionts community. In addition to, the, to this comparison, we also decided to conduct uh, an experiment in which we uh, analyze the plasticity of some key parameters during a light stress experiment. So here are the first results. So um, first we found that uh, the uh, symbiodynastic community aboard uh, by the coral host differed significantly with depths and was for instance, twice higher uh, in shallow colonies, so in light blue compared to uh, deep colonies, mesophytic colonies, uh, which is uh, displayed in uh, dark blue. And uh, the symbionts community uh, in those colonies uh, were also uh, of different composition uh, with uh, shallow colonies uh, uh, hosting mainly uh, Symbiodinium uh, microadriaticum species, uh, while the Symbiodinaceae uh, community in mesophytic colonies was mainly related to uh, on the symbionts related to the genus uh, Cladocopium. We also measured the respiration rates of uh, the allobions, which was two times higher uh, in shallow colonies compared to mesophotic colonies. And as suspected, the chlorophyll content, so here you have chlorophyll A and chlorophyll C2, was also uh, significantly higher in mesophotic colonies. So you can see here on this diagram, so the higher abundance of chlorophyll content. But when we do the ratio between chlorophyll A and chlorophyll C2, which is indicative of um, the size of the photosynthetic antenna, so the proteins uh, that are involved in the uh, um, light harvesting, we can see that uh, the antenna, the size of the antenna is similar between uh, both types of colonies. After that, uh, we decided to compare uh, the photosynthetic activity of Stylophora pisciata colonies uh, by conducting what we called light response curves. So we just compare the photosynthetic activity at different light intensities. And we found that uh, gross photosynthesis based on chlorophyll content was lower uh, in uh, mesophotic colonies along the light curve, as you can see here. In contrast, 
when uh, we uh, normalize uh, these measurements uh, by coral surface area instead of chlorophyll, we can see that there is uh, no more uh, difference between both steps. Then uh, we evaluated the uh, PS2 activity of electron transport by chlorophyll efluorescence or uh, by absorbance. So by chlorophyll efluorescence, it gives information about uh, photosystem 2 activity, while by absorbance, it gives information about the activity of PS1, photosystem 1. So uh, we can see here on these uh, diagrams the, that the relative electron transport rate is slightly lower and significantly lower in, um, for PS2 in mesophilic colonies compared to shallow colonies. But what we look, when we look at uh, the activity of PS1, uh, there is no difference. Now, if we observe uh, the non photochemical quenching, which is a parameter which is indicative of uh, a photoprotective mechanisms, uh, we can see that uh, shallow colonies are able to do uh, this process much higher than uh, the uh, shallow colonies. This is for photosystem 2. And we can also see that uh, here the, um, for PS1, NPQ due to PS1 acceptor site limitation was higher uh, in uh, mesophytic colonies, slightly higher in mesophytic colonies compared to uh, shallow colonies. Uh, so let's come now to the alternative uh, electron uh, flow. And because some alternative electron flow involve only PS2 while other involve only PS1 or both photosystem, their occurrence will have distinct effect on ETR when measured at PS1 or PS2 and on oxygen evolution. So to inv investigate that part, we first evaluated the electron routing towards oxygen, so the Mellor reaction, by comparing it, the electron transport rate through photosystems uh, and net photosynthesis. And we can observe a nonlinear relationship between these two parameters so it is linear now, like here, and then at higher light intensity, it becomes linear, okay? With a saturation of uh, net photosynthesis while the electron transport rate through photosystem two is still increasing. And uh, this pattern uh, is indicative, in fact, of uh, reduction of oxygens uh, by uh, photosynthetic electrons. So we decided to estimate the oxygen uptake in the light, and we found that these parameters, so this is here, was similar between shallow and mesophotic colonies. And this represents about 30, 40 to 50% of the total electron transport rates at the higher last intensity uh, measured. Then uh, we decided to compare the um, electron transport rate uh, through PS2 with the one at PS1. And uh, we observe a linear relationship at low light intensities, but at higher high light intensity, we can see that PS2 electron transport rate start to saturate while PS1 still continue to increase. And this uh, discrepancy is indicative in fact of uh, cyclic electron flow in which electrons coming from uh, PS1 are injected back to uh, uh, cytochrome B6F and so on. And so we decided to measure this uh, cyclic electron flow. And we can see here that uh, cyclic electron flow is higher in shallow colonies compared to mesophotic colonies. Finally, um, we decided to compare the photosynthetic plasticity between shallow and mesophotic colonies by conducting a three days photoacclimation experiment. So uh, we exposed uh, these colonies to low light treatment. So it means 10 micromole of photons uh, or highlights, uh, 1,500 uh, micromole photons for three days. And um, we measure different parameters, such as the photosynthetic efficiency. And you can see here that the maximal photochemical quantum yield, IV over FM, is declining significantly 
uh, when both types of colonies are uh, exposed to high light, especially uh, those colonies from uh, the mesophotic environment. And this is consistent with uh, the um, max growth photosynthesis, uh, at least for uh, the shallow colonies, because it remains stable uh, in um, shallow colonies, sorry, and it decreases in uh, mesophotic colonies. The low light treatment uh, also induces a decrease in uh, PS1 uh, ear, um, electron transport rate and PS2 also electron transport rate, as you can see here, a decrease for both. Okay. And this is consistent with the lower value observed for uh, the uh, maximum maximal growth photosynthesis and also the lower NPQ observed three days after the treatment. The highlight treatment uh, resulted in a very low uh, ETR PS2 for uh, shallow colony, uh, for mesophotic colonies here, but uh, you can observe that there is still a substantial uh, ETR PS1 uh, in mesophotic colonies. So it seems that in that condition, PS2 is crushed while PS1 uh, still continue to operate uh, like before. And we analyze also uh, the importance of cyclic electron flow. Uh, and we can see that both colonies exposed to uh, high light treatment were increasing uh, cyclic electron flow, as you can see here on this uh, graph. So in a conclusion, uh, the photosynthetic capacity of symbionts from shallow colonies is higher than in mesophotic colonies at light intensity above uh, 130 microenstein, but it's similar at the Elobians level. This result uh, is related to several traits uh, of mesophotic corals, such as the lower symbionts uh, density, but the higher chlorophyll content and the lower respiration rate. However, it is to note that the daily max light intensity is 20 times lower at 40 meters compared to 10 meters, so carbon fixation and translocation is likely to be lower in mesophotic colonies compared to uh, shallow colonies. When looking, uh, when looking at uh, the photosynthetic efficiency, uh, PS1 activity is similar and PS2 activity is a bit lower in mesophotic colonies. So the photosynthetic efficiency is relatively similar between both depths. And in addition, the antenna size uh, doesn't differ. However, the NPQ uh, capacity, so the non-photochemical quenching capacity, is lower in mesophotic colonies. And during uh, the light stress, we observe the collapse of photosynthesis when mesophotic colonies were exposed to high light for three days. So mesophotic colonies would be able to uh, maintain uh, the integrity of the photosynthetic apparatus under short-term high light stress but probably not on the long term, uh, such as uh, hours and days. Uh, this research also highlights uh, the importance of uh, PS1 activity as a photoprotective mechanism under condition causing uh, PS2 photo damage. And uh, by maintaining a high PS1 activity, it is also indicative uh, of uh, enhanced use of alternative electron flow such as uh, the cyclic electron flow or the major reaction. Um, regarding the alternative electron flow, we found that the nature were uh, similar across the depths analyzed. Uh, both types of colonies show the same capacity for the major reaction, but this reaction mainly occur, occurs at light intensities above uh, 350 uh, micromoles of photons which is a light intensity that is uh, unlikely to occur at 40 meters. Um, besides, uh, cyclic electron flow uh, was found to be higher in shallow colonies. And this means that both alternative electron flow are very likely uh, to play a role in the photoprotective mechanisms in shallow colonies. And uh, uh, although the extent of alternative electron flow and in PQ differs between colonies. Uh, we don't think that they are specific to the symbiont species hosted at those depths, as, the, as those depths. Uh, 
since uh, these parameters were shown to be relatively plastic during the light stress. So this is it. Um, I would like to thank my different uh, colleagues and partner for this project. So um, Erwin Levy's lab members, uh, the IUI staff, uh, but also uh, our funding agency, uh, ERC, FNRS, University of Liège, and uh, of course, uh, the Assemble Plus program. So I don't know if you have any question right now, but uh, anyway, uh, don't hesitate to contact me if you wish. Uh, if you have any question later of if you are interested in, in developing a collaborative project with us later. Thank you very much, Stefan. Very interesting. And uh, especially this uh, balance between the symbiotes and uh, at the level of uh, the holobionts, uh, okay. it is quite unbalanced, but you have dissecated the, the several factors. We tried to. <laughs> yes. So do we have any questions from the audience? Nothing in the chat, nothing in the window. I think we don't have, and it was very clear anyway. <laughs> oh, not. And it's very interesting. In terms of um, these differences in light intensity, uh, do they occur in the nature? Do they occur more now or, or not? What is your idea? It, it changes with uh, the seasons. Um, of course, in summer, uh, it increases uh, in the mesophytic part of the reef, but uh, it's not high enough, of course. So uh, in terms of lighting, and intensity is not very comparable. But it's just to demonstrate here um, uh, if, uh, for instance, when you expose um, colonies that are uh, low light acclimated, for example, uh, if they are just um, getting more light, are they, are, are they going to rely on uh, alternative electron flow? Or what are the, the strategy? So this is something, this, all these measurements will not occur uh, in nature, but this is used to um, better understand how- uh, How does it work? Yeah, how do they how adapt? They... Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just that I, I was wondering if with uh, some um, global changes or something, if there is any question, any factors that could change the intensity of light, like uh, when we have the blooms or whatever. Uh, yeah, it, 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 can decrease, it, it can decrease the light intensity, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's factors like that yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's more some spreading of uh, blooms or whatever yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's more and, in, and in that case they would have to adapt differently at that timing yeah. yes exactly yeah. so thank you so much stefan and it's my pleasure to announce the last speaker of this session which is uh, marine valley from the max Planck institute for chemical ecology in germany uh, that will talk about the chemical ecology of the algal holobion. You can speak, Marie. All right. Thanks very much, Patricia, for uh, the invitation to present uh, the, my work on um, uh, chemical ecology of algae and uh, microbe association. So I'm sitting right now in Jena in Germany. It's a small town in the middle of Germany. You have your picture of this town. And uh, I'm part of the Max Planck Fellow Group uh, Phytoplankton Community Interaction. And uh, I've been working on phytoplankton interaction together with uh, parasites. That's one part of uh, what I will talk about today and uh, using uh, mainly metabolomics as a tool to solve the chemical uh, uh, signaling between this, uh, during these interactions. So um, we, of course, we are very far away from the ocean. So I really want to thank uh, Assemble Plus, which uh, allow us to go back uh, to the field, to sample and uh, to, um, yeah, provide us uh, the, the tool to go and get our marine organisms. And because we work with uh, marine and um, freshwater uh, organisms. So that was uh, pretty cool. So uh, today my talk is about, I have two parts of my talk. I will first talk about uh, my PhD studies on the uh, seaweed holobiont, uh, the microbe association with seaweed and what uh, signalins we were identifying. This was a work done uh, at Sorbonne University 
um, the naturalist History Museum of Paris, and um, I was also visiting at SAMS, uh, thanks to the Assemble Press funding. And the next part will be about uh, the work during my postdoc phase, working on microbial interaction in phytoplankton, using metabolomics uh, to um, identify interesting compounds involved in this, uh, in this mediation. Okay, so maybe first of all, I'd like to define holobionts. This is one concept within the symbiosis world. So two or more organisms can associate uh, together. And um, I would say, especially when we deal with microbes, but also when you see on this picture, it's not so easy to define whatever the uh, interaction is beneficial or adverse. And what if there's really an interaction, actually? I think one of the main examples that is well known is the symbiosis between plants and fungi. Uh, where the fungi uh, living associated to the roots of the plants can provide nutrients and um, uh, in exchange uh, get also uh, protection and, and nutrients back from the plants. Yeah? And uh, of course, we can define then the holobiont of the host. So for instance, can be a plant or human or also over more exotic uh, organisms, let's say like the corals or algae, which live together in association with microbes. So you've been uh, seeing fungi, but there's also many other microbes. We can count the bacteria, many eukaryotic single cells. We all put them in this so-called protein group. And uh, of course the virus uh, as part of this component. And uh, the holobiont means it's an assemblage of this host and all these other species living and interacting around it. They will all form what we call a biomolecular network because they will exchange chemical signals. And usually the relationship between this host and microbes, it's a mirror of the evolution of the host because they've been associated often for a long time in the evolution. So they could even exchange gene, exchange function and provide a uh, resource for each other. Um, one, I would say, uh, a bit unknown organ, um, holobiont is the seaweed holobiont. Uh, you have here an example of a kelp field uh, that can be seen in Roscoff, France. It's at the tip of Brittany. So at low tide, uh, we can uh, go easily sample this uh, photosynthetic uh, uh, algae. And uh, what is uh, not so known is that many microbes can live in association with this algae, such as fungi. In fact, um, one part of the study was to, um, to discover whether these microbes, such as fungi and bacteria, can uh, interact with the host and can protect the host against pathogen. So one methodology I will present now was to elucidate the biodiversity of these uh, microbes associated to fungi to understand their role, potential role, uh, such as protecting against algal pathogens. And of course, one of our main hypotheses was uh, that chemicals might be released and protect the host against these pathogens. So I will present you the different methodology and uh, results we obtained uh, within this and how we can study the seaweed holobiont. So one part was, of course, to elucidate what microbes were living associated to the tissue. So we went sampling in France and Scotland, uh, seaweed species. And uh, the next step was to look at the microbes living uh, in association with the tissue, with the inner tissue, what we would call endophytes, if we were in the uh, terrestrial uh, plant world, let's say. Uh, so what we had to do was to surface sterilize to avoid all these epiphytes, and then um, recover the facultative microbes by putting the tissue of seaweeds on agar plate using a different solid medium. And uh, through this process, we could recover uh, 300 bacterial strains and nearly 100 fungi uh, that were all then taxonomically uh, identified by extracting the DNA and doing uh, simple sequencing uh, based on 16 and 18 and 18S RDNA. We then also proceed to obtain, to extract these organisms um, using different organic solvents to create a chemical library because our, our aim was to then test this library against pathogen models that uh, we can cultivate a wear model uh, at the time. So thanks to the Assemble um, 
um, funding. We call it Go to Open uh, It's Hubs at the Scottish Association for Marine Science, where a unique uh, system using this pathogen model, such as Eurycasma dixoni, uh, are able to, um, to infect in seaweeds. So we developed a protocol uh, that I can now explain uh, in this uh, schematic uh, drawing. Uh, so we had our healthy seaweed, uh, the model Ectocarpus siliculosus, that was retained in a mesh. And then we had uh, infected algae with ever uh, one or, or, of these uh, pathogen models, such as Eurycasma, Anisolpidium, Molinia, and so on. And uh, of course, this parasite will release uh, new flagellated forms that will infect the host. So if we had nothing uh, and we just incubate over time, uh, we will see Ectocarpus infected over here. To test whether the chemicals uh, from our fungi and bacteria had an effect on the parasite, on the free living form of the parasite, we put in the medium extract or even uh, purified compounds uh, to test whether it could kill the parasite. We were then um, um, looking at uh, the phenotype of Ectocarpus and deciding, uh, checking whether it was infected uh, or not. We had two methods for quantifying infection in ectocarpus. We designed a microscopy scale, so looking at cultures and defining from not infected to evil infected. But we also, um, complementary to that, uh, use uh, DNA uh, qPCR to quantify the DNA uh, of parasite inside the host. Uh, and with this, we were able to select and to discover um, several uh, strains of fungi, but were able to completely uh, inhibit uh, the infection. So meaning that there was uh, no infection of ectocarpus um, um, and inhibit this parasite. We then proceed to take these strains and uh, such as this one, for instance, uh, a fungi that was identified as Phaeospheria uh, species. And then we uh, did large scale cultivation, uh, many liters of cultures, extracting on more, and this time doing, uh, let's say, common classical natural product chemistry approach, purifying uh, using preparative HPLC, colon chromatography, and uh, obtaining pure compounds that were then uh, characterized using NMR and mass spectrometry. We then identified a series of polyketides that belong all to a family called pyrenocins, and among them was one uh, new product, pyrenocin N. We then proceed to take this um, pure compound to test them once more in our system, and we could find that two of them, pyrenocin A and B, actually had a broad spectrum activity against all pathogen tested, um, as we can see here. We have an example in Pyropia where we add uh, the standards, the, the purified compound to the cells, and you can see here all the infected cells um, shown with these red arrows. And um, if we look over time, uh, we add the compounds and then observe that these cells were shrinking and dying. So these infected cells were um, affected by the addition of our purified compound. And that's how we could uh, conclude that these com two compounds uh, were responsible for uh, antiparasitic activities observed. Of course, at the time we had no clue yet uh, of the mechanisms all these compounds can kill the parasite, and this is a study in process. But by looking at all the fungi organisms, we also um, identified, uh, interestingly, an obligate marine fungi. The name is uh, Dandriella uh, salina, it has been renamed actually quite recently. And uh, we could identify um, very intriguing compounds, uh, novel structure uh, that we, you can see over here. Uh, thanks to uh, mass spectrometry methods. And uh, what we then did with this compound was to test them against uh, bacteria, or Heidi was to test whether they have uh, antibiotic activity. We, for instance, found out that when we test them against a model for um, crumb sensing uh, signaling with uh, Chromobacterium VLCM, we could find that all of the compounds uh, identified could inhibit uh, the crumb sensing activity. So these compounds identified uh, possess a crumb quenching uh, effect. Uh, this is very interesting because we could imagine that in planta, within the seaweed, uh, these compounds might also act against the bacteria uh, associated with seaweeds, such as uh, competing organisms. Uh, 
So this is the first part of my talk showing about the algal, um, how we studied the algal holobiont recovering facultative strain uh, using a classical natural product uh, chemistry approach to identify uh, the pyranosins and these novel butanolids, which have different um, antiparasitic antibiotic effect. And also we, we were, I was associated with a lab testing, of course, for over pharmacological uh, activity. We also found some of them have anti-cancer activity. So this work is in now in, in process. Okay, so after, uh, after this um, uh, first part, I'd like now to talk about a more uh, closer topic of mine uh, I've been working on uh, at the Max Planck Institute this last uh, five years. This is another case of algal ball obions, but this time not with seaweed, but with phytoplankton. I think you've, most of you have already seen uh, these pictures uh, with these colored waters. This is a bloom of microalgae. A uh, million of cells that will um, accumulate and reproduce uh, in one location over the ocean. And what you have to imagine is that these blooms are usually not just one species uh, of algae, such as Emiliana cox um, oxalane, a coccolithophorus, but also many other microbes associated with, for instance, bacteria or virus that can infect cells and associate with these cells. So, uh, we need really to consider that this bloom uh, of uh, unicellular single cells uh, are actually not uh, homogeneous. You can have within the population some other cells with a different phenotype, and sometimes these cells can be infected and can create a, then, um, a whole decimation of the, of the whole population. Because, for instance, all these different uh, single cell algae, we have here some example with diatoms, Coccolithophores um, and uh, dinoflagellate can be killed by um, microbes such as bacteria, virus, or eukaryotic protists. And uh, in the end, we don't know much about any mechanisms how uh, the, these microbes can infect and kill the cells. Never also the chemical signal is involved. So um, these microbes will appear usually. Uh, you have here an uh, a, a drawing of a different phase of the bloom from dormancy to initiation, persistence and demise, and then of course succession to the next bloom. All these microbes will appear uh, essentially at the persistence and demise phase. Uh, they will attack the cells, the cells will be able to defend themselves, but at some point uh, there's a switch and uh, parasite organisms such as virus or other protists can uh, infect enough cells and contribute to the bloom termination. But once again, I want to emphasize uh, that the mechanisms uh, supporting the infection of this host and the defense um, against parasite is unknown. We don't know any chemicals, uh, so we, we were not knowing any chemicals uh, involved in this interaction. So that's why uh, I developed within my group uh, models of parasites that can infect bloom-forming diatoms. You have here the example with Cosinodiscus crania. And uh, this is healthy cells uh, that we have in culture here in the lab that were sampled uh, in Elkolon, Germany. And uh, we are now able to infect these cultures. And you have here a video showing the release of a parasite from an infected host. So this is all these smaller cells coming out of the tubes. Uh, this is Laganisma cosinodici, it's a nomycete that can infect a uh, diatom from the genus Cosinodiscus. And what you've just seen is the release of a free flagellated form that then go to infect uh, other cells. Um, you need really to understand that the life cycle of this parasite is uh, quite complex. You've just seen uh, what we call the sporont. This is the reproduction stage with the release of source spore. And all these small source spores must find quickly a host to infect a susceptible host and uh, will develop then within a feeding stage. And you can see that between these different stage, you have different size, but also different morphology and different phenotype. You have here two examples of model I'm working with, uh, the oomycete infecting diatoms, and also a parasite, a generalist parasite that can infect uh, the dinoflagellate Alexandrium minutum. And it's 
all of these cells can coexist in the same culture, especially if the culture are not synchronized. So this is another challenge to address when we want to um, understand the chemicals as um, associated with each of these cells. Okay, so we don't know the, the chemicals involved in host defense infection. Uh, these are eukaryotes, so they for sure do sex and might use pheromones. And of course, uh, where, where is, uh, there is uh, chemicals attracting the zoospore to the host. So this is the research question I'm developing within my group at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, I will show you now one example how we study this interaction between uh, the diatome and the oomycete. Uh, I'm using these co-culture uh, chambers. Um, maybe some of you have already worked with them. Uh, these are uh, glass vials separated by membrane, where basically you can put different type of population face to face. In our experiments, we had our control with healthy cell sculpture, healthy diatoms, and then we uh, were comparing healthy uh, but uh, cells exposed to infected population. Why I say exposed? Because this membrane does not uh, let any organisms pass, but let the su supernatant and full of chemicals pass. So there's still chemical exchange between population. So even if the cells were healthy because the parasite could not pass there, they were still exposed to the chemical released by the infection. We then uh, proceed to use comparative metabolomics by extracting this population and injecting in LCMS to recover the profile. And uh, we distinguish uh, really clearly uh, the different population from healthy exposed to infected. And then by using spectral similarity approaches, uh, we proceed to identify the compound that were uh, associated with infected cells. We found two alkaloids, uh, surprisingly, uh, that were also associated with infection. Alkaloids have a very group of important compounds uh, used by plants, but also algae um, in many functions, usually a bioactive substance. So uh, we were able to buy them as standard and to pursue the identification, not only identification, but quantification. We were able to look at um, that they were overexpressed during the infection. So these are algal compounds because we found a very low amount in the healthy cells, but a very higher amount in the infection. And when we put these compounds with healthy cultures, we found at the relevant concentration an inhibition of the cell division. And when we put these compounds with infected uh, cultures, we found a, a faster infection rate. This show that the parasite is using these algal compounds to increase the infection to inhibit any host defense uh, from the diatom. So we could show that these compounds are basically mediator of this hijack uh, of the host metabolisms that is done by uh, the oomycete. We could even localize and see these effects uh, in cells by microscopy, and especially because these compounds can fluoresce under special lights, uh, we could use the confocal laser scanning microscopy to look at the accumulation of these compounds in the infected cells here, the sporons, as you can see. Okay, so I'm just checking the time. Uh, my last part will be it, to talk about the tools we developed, again, thanks to Assemble Plus, where we could go in the field and develop a new protocol to address the cellular heterogeneity and especially address the problem of uh, all these different cell types that we can see in our uh, parasite uh, infected cultures. So as I've, as I've told you, these blooms is not often one species. You can have many species found uh, together and some of them can be infected. So when we look at a uh, bloom sample, we can see a very high heterogeneity in phenotype between cells. And uh, sometimes it's easy to say, okay, this cell is the sporont, it's infected. But what about these other cells that we're seeing here? Yeah, even dead cells uh, that we can see over here. So how can we address this heterogeneity and how can we, um, uh, we wanted to provide a tool based on mass spectrometry to identify uh, these different phenotypes in single cell. So we develop a single cell metabolomics that is now enriched uh, in the Max Planck using a MALDI orbitrap. We could target one single cell 
and recover a single cell profile that we could then um, identify using um, look and study using uh, different statistics and data processing. We have now um, uh, tools using scripts to be able to compare control and treatment, for instance, if we want to identify also significant metabolites. So with this protocol, we have sampled and identified uh, and used uh, wall spectrum uh, matching as fingerprint to identify algal species. Uh, we were hence able with one single cell to be able to say what uh, species um, name was it. We did that with many uh, algae of uh, especially diatot species because they, they were big enough for our analysis. And we also work with freshwater algae. We work with Hematococcus pluvialis, uh, that you might know uh, accumulates uh, astaxanthin pigments during stress. And uh, we were able to analyze cells at different uh, stage, growth stage. And uh, with our single cell metabolomics, we were able to discriminate the early to the late stage uh, growth. Every point here is the metabolome of one cell. And uh, we were also able to look and quantify um, a relative quantification of the pigments accumulation during this different phase of growth. So we could reveal with uh, this new tool, the metabolic change associated with phenotype. And last but not least, I'm going back to my um, uh, interaction between parasite and uh, algae. We also use this workflow to uh, design a new health diagnostic uh, to have, for instance, a diatome infect and not infected, uh, collect them, uh, perform the single cell mass spectrometry, and be able to say, OK, we have uh, this infection by uh, this parasite species uh, and what compounds biomarker can be detected. We have done that with uh, two models, organisms, uh, very recently submit work. Uh, so uh, this is still in the pipeline, but uh, we have identified uh, correctly uh, the infection phenotype uh, by all my seed infecting diatome, but also working with uh, infecting dinoflagellate with Alexandra Minutum. I will not go too much uh, into detail right now because I see the time is running. Uh, I'd like to say that now there's a new, um, I'm developing a new uh, group uh, continuing this algal parasite interaction. I am very interested, um, we are very interested within this consortium of research uh, by chemical signaling, continuing uh, identifying uh, compounds associated with uh, parasite infection. But we're also interested by if we had another partner such as bacteria or a resistant algae together with our system, are we able to, um, the parasite, is it still virulent? Is there any change of infection? And wherever our compounds such as the carbolins are still uh, effective or not. This is a new project that is now running for the next four years. And uh, I want really to make a small advertisement because I'm looking now to hire a one PhD student. Uh, so if you know any master candidate that will be interested by this research topic, please um, forward them my uh, email. Okay. So, okay. So I hope you had a good overview of our research. Uh, I'd like to thanks, of course, the group I'm working with. Uh, thanks all the fundings and thanks again, Assemble. Uh, I will for sure, if there is a new funding um, period, apply on more because this was very uh, precious into obtaining sample and being able to work with and developing, for instance, uh, workflow with single cell metabolomics. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Mahir. I hope it's not too long, but... Uh, no, very well on time. Much. And we still have five minutes for questions from, All right. from the audience. And uh, just a comment. This is very, very interesting. These uh, co-cultures cool and then uh, the analyzing the metabolites and at single level. So do we have any questions from the audience? Let's see, not in the chat. And in the list of people. No, you were very clear that this. Yes, wasn't... that's awesome. So I don't know for who is listening to me, but I want to say uh, we are very open for collaboration. So I start working also with parasite of freshwater algae. Uh, I have started collaborating, of course, with uh, people in the field. But if you have a system and you would like to do metabolomics or there is a compound you'd like to detect, uh, we have a lot of tools and we are very open for collaboration. So uh, please contact contact us. I, I work with a group of Professor Bonnet and Thomas Richard, 
um, at the Uni Jena right now uh, for the next four years, uh, but we really are open for collaboration, so don't hesitate to please uh, contact also a PhD student uh, opportunity. Yeah, also, yeah, yeah. because the, the funding period starts uh, 1st of July for four years, and yeah, the person has to start as soon as possible, otherwise they have less time, so yes. Yeah. Very good opportunity. So I was I have the curiosity, which is uh, then it, then you said it's uh, next project also, which is interaction with bacteria, and then if there is anything known about the virus and virome of this algae. No, we don't have any. So we have start um, isolating facultative bacteria from the system, from healthy and infected, uh, start to identify them, uh, doing some also uh, genome sequencing to have the idea of their ability, what they can do. Uh, but we still really at the start. So um, virus, I never test the culture to check if there's virus hiding within there. So if someone is interested to take part of this, uh, that would be amazing because at some point, you have to outsource, yeah, you cannot do everything. Uh, but yeah, we could imagine that maybe a virus uh, could co-occur together with a parasite and uh, during the bloom. And uh, this will be like joint force to better infect. And anyway, I think they are for sure in competition then for the same host. I think it's just uh, at the time it has been very hard to cultivate this parasite, especially this eukaryotic parasite. It's not so easy. They are obligate uh, biotroph. So they really need their host to survive. And so you need to have always this healthy culture running and so on. Uh, but I think now that we have a system in hands and we have some profile, we would like to go back to the field uh, doing um, mesocosm experiments, but also just sampling and uh, identify them again. And of course, if it's possible to get a virus or bacteria, but it's coexisting, this would be amazing. So if you have any strain, <laughs> if you have any strain, uh, that will be yeah. great. So very it's interesting. Also good. So we yeah, don't yeah. have to start from scratch, but if there's already a strain that is like, might also uh, infect this type of diatom and dinoflagellate I work with, I'm really open mm -hmm. to pursuing uh, yes. any study. So that to study the interactions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marine.